Good morning, everyone. Dr. Ashish Lele, Director of CSIR NIIST and Director NCL, distinguished speakers and attendees. We are starting the event on smart materials and smart glass. Smart materials are a class of functional materials capable of exhibiting a measurable change in their properties upon exposure to various external stimuli. Fast-paced innovation and focused R&D have led to unprecedented and augmented use of smart materials in various applications. Buildings across the globe consume a huge amount of energy for lighting and maintaining indoor temperature. A major concern in the global energy landscape is the energy wastage in commercial buildings that consume more than 40% of the total supplied power and more than 30% energy gets wasted through the windows. The exponentially increasing demand for energy in the architectural sector may be mitigated to a large extent by efficiently modulating the indoor temperature and light. Performance chemicals for smart glass application is therefore a huge market that remains largely untapped in India. The tunable properties of these smart materials and devices directly reflect in their light and heat transmission, leading to energy efficiency and utilization, especially under indoor lighting and cooling, and also contribute to glare reduction. These smart systems can be integrated with other clean energy technologies, such as solar cells, to provide access to a complete building integrated solution for the realization of net positive energy buildings, apart from ensuring need-based privacy. According to several market reports, the smart glass demand in India is expected to grow at a rate of 25 percentage as compared to a global CAGR of 13 to 14 percentage of which the chromogenic systems such as electro, thermo and photochromic materials and devices are envisioned to be the key market segments. The scope for developmental activities in this field is corroborated by the fact that Indian market has so far a limited exposure to such high performance smart glass technologies. Therefore, significant efforts are still needed to take these interactive systems beyond academic interest and proof of concept applications. A cost effective smart glass technology compared to the scarcely imported competing technologies is expected to facilitate the entry of Indian industries into smart glass market in line with the Make in India, Innovate in India and Atmanirbhar Bharat initiatives of the central government. Such an intervention would considerably reduce indoor energy consumption and play a crucial role in the establishment of net positive energy buildings under the smart cities mission and reliable power policies of the central government with up to 30% cooling energy savings and more than 25% reduction in peak demand. For a country like India, with high scope for vertical extension of cities, buildings have tremendous implications in the energy sector and total available window area becomes crucial in efficient energy management. Therefore, a reliable smart glass technology may become an indispensable part of smart buildings leading to smarter cities. Therefore, the Ministry of Science and Technology and the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, having understood the requirement and significance of smart glass technologies, have come up with the Industry Connect event to mobilize, foster and handhold academic R&D industry alliances in developing and commercializing multifunctional and scalable smart glass technologies. With this introduction, may I now invite Dr. K. N. Narayan Nunni, Senior Principal Scientist, CSIR NIST, and Vertical Leader, Energy Conversion, Energy and Energy Devices theme of CSIR for his welcome address. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Srijit. That uh, nicely summed up our activities in uh, the importance of the area. So that has set the stage for today's uh, presentations. Uh, respected Director, distinguished invitees, dear colleagues, uh, from CSAR and other uh, institutes, ladies and gentlemen. So as we all know, we are celebrating Asadi Kamarat Mahotsav to mark the 75th anniversary of Indian independence. And Ministry of Science and Technology and Ministry of Health Science have come together with this program of iConnect in which 75 events are being organized for increased interaction and handholding with the industry. So in this connection, I'm very happy to see that 11 out of these this 75 events are organized by the thematic group on energy and today we have two of these events which are organized by CSIR and NIAST. So NIAST, uh, meaning National Institute for Interdisciplinary Science and Technology is a nodal lab for energy conversion and related activities. Uh, this is a sub vertical under the energy theme and 14 CSIR labs work with us in this vertical, which include photovoltaics, thermoelectrics, photovoltaic allied technologies and many other 
uh, technologies which are related to energy generation, energy conservation, and little bit of energy management. So we are thankful to the organizers of iConnect program for giving us this opportunity to coordinate these two events. Now it is my great pressure to welcome you all to this session. Dr. Ashish Lele, Director NIST and Director NCL has kindly agreed to innovate the event. His research interests are smart hydrogels, polymers, advanced materials. In fact, he doesn't need an introduction to energy community in India. His current research interests are end-to-end -end hydrogen value chain with detailed knowledge of techno-economics, business opportunities, and technology advances, mostly in fuel cells and mobility, power, and heating applications, and deep understanding of fundamental science behind transport phenomena, reaction engineering in polymer electric membrane fuel cells, and so on. So on behalf of all the uh, uh, people assembled here for the online event, let me uh, welcome Dr. Ashish Lele to this iConnect event. Welcome, sir. Uh, Dr. Sir, Dr. Pravin Kumar Vemori uh, is representing ASA India Glass Limited. Uh, Mr. Radish, Senior Engineer, Active Glazing, St. Govan uh, Research, India. Dr. Masimba Philip from Glass Futures UK, Dr. Mugesh Kumar from CSAR CSAO, Dr. Nagesh Babu from CSAR CBRI, Dr. Kishore Kulkarni from CSR CBRI, Dr. Uh, Mr. Mugesh Sethi from Asa India Glass Limited, and Dr. Ajita Pukutan may also join us from Glass Futures Limited UK. So I would also extend a warm welcome to all the participants who kindly accepted our in invitation to be present here for the iConnect event and also to the CSR colleagues and all others attending this session on various online platforms such as YouTube and Facebook and the other uh, iConnect platform also. So once again, let me welcome all of you to the event. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Lee. You, Dr. Thank you very much. May I now invite Dr. Ashish Lele, Director CSIR NIST and CSIR NCL for his inaugural address. Sir, please. Thank you, Srijit. Thank you, Dr. Uni, uh, for those very kind words of introduction. Uh, absolutely delighted to uh, be participant in this uh, iConnect event. And I think uh, CSR NIST is uh, leading this very important technology area, which combines uh, really advanced materials with uh, uh, energy conservation, uh, which is a much, much needed uh, demand uh, today and will increase in the uh, coming, coming days. Uh, it is interesting to sort of reflect back, you know, when we look at our Indian indigenous uh, technologies for construction of buildings. Uh, we have always been very close to nature and as a tropical country, uh, the kind of buildings that we have always designed uh, traditionally uh, have always incorporated energy conservation uh, in the design of the building, the selection of material of construction of the building and so on. Uh, I think every country with its own climatic conditions uh, must adopt its own ways of uh, uh, energy uh, conservation. However, as our cities grow and the population moves to more and more urban areas, uh, as Shrijit also mentioned, uh, we are going to grow vertically. Uh, I remember when you know the large multinationals started coming in a big way in the country in the early 90s when the economy opened up. Uh, that was some of the first times that we saw tall buildings with glass facades. Uh, we had never seen those kinds of buildings in, in the earlier days. Uh, and I still remember wondering uh, how will they manage the temperature inside with all the glass uh, bringing in the IR radiation through, uh, how are we going to manage the environment inside these buildings uh, being such a tropical country. Uh, these kinds of constructions are okay in uh, countries in Europe, in the US and so on, where the climatic condition favors such kind of construction. Uh, in India, we were all surprised to see this same construction coming up. But this is today an inevitable fact of life. And uh, it is for us to accept uh, that this is going to come and this is going to stay. Uh, and these buildings are going to only improve. Uh, all of these buildings, uh, or many of them, are also centrally air conditioned. So with uh, with uh, heat coming in, in terms of IR, the load on the air conditioning is uh, only going to increase. Uh, and as we all worry about climate change and we worry about greenhouse gas emissions, 
uh, we have to worry about what we need to do to uh, keep our uh, buildings greener right with uh, you know, on the one side we allow ir in, uh, radiation to come in on the other side we in, increase centralized air conditioning and all of that uh, is not a very good idea so in this context i think it is important that we have smart solutions uh, for such buildings and i think uh, the kind of uh, uh, chromogenic materials that uh, uh, that are coming up in a big way will have a huge market for india there is no doubt about it uh, not just in the buildings but also in automotive sectors uh, again very india specific uh, application there is uh, all of us who drive on indian highways especially uh, after sunset we worry about uh, the glare that that comes from our reflected mirrors uh, we are all accustomed to driving with uh, hazard lights on for some strange reason and that causes a huge glare for for drivers in all automotives uh, so those kinds of automotive applications uh, which can prevent this this glare or reduce this amount of glare that affects driving conditions is also a very india specific application and i think this is also something that is going to pick up uh, so i think smart glass is uh, is here for stay it's going to increase the market is going to increase and shrijit already talked about uh, the numbers that tell you how much of uh, this market growth is expected i think uh, in csr labs uh, we're very happy to see that multiple labs are coming together very happy to see that cbri and labs like nist have come together uh, to look at an end to end solution uh, and this is very important to to think about end to end solution because normally we will only look at a small part of a value chain in a technology or in an application uh, and sometimes we forget that the real value lies elsewhere than what we are doing it's only when you really do conceive and do end to end technology development or end to end product development that you are able to capture the entire value chain and it's very good to see that uh, multiple csir labs have come together to develop this application i'm very very happy extremely happy uh, to also see industry participation in this and companies like saint gobain uh, are clearly leaders in this in this area i'm very happy to have them on board uh, not just in this i connect but also in our in our programs uh, i think india has a very very strong base in chemical industry and when i say chemical industry i mean uh, not just organic chemicals uh, you know for uh, dye stuff and agrochemicals and and uh, apis for drug industry i'm talking even bigger um, canvas of advanced organic chemicals advanced materials uh, and the indian chemical industry is full of entrepreneurs uh, they these are people who realize the market growth they have their antennas always open for opportunities that are coming up and i'm pretty sure that uh, chemicals that uh, go into these kinds of applications smart window application the chromogenic dyes are essentially chemicals right they are advanced material they are advanced chemicals uh, and the indian chemical industry with its very strong base uh, can actually become one of the global suppliers uh in 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 this segment we all know that the world is looking for a china plus scenario uh and i think uh, with the indian chemical industry we should harness this potential uh, to be able to become a global supplier of some of these materials so in the whole uh, program that csir is doing uh, i i also hope that the chromogenic materials that we are making in our labs Uh, we also have a work package that involves large scale manufacturing of of these materials and we should also bring on board industry partners who are chemist chemical manufacturers uh, who would be willing to manufacture these chemicals at large scale so while companies like saint gobain are developers of the application and suppliers of such smart windows to the end user we should also have those companies who will eventually manufacture these materials which can then be put into uh, these these smart windows so uh, 
uh, I'm not fully aware of how this program is, is conceived. I've just taken charge of uh, NIST a while ago. So, uh, uh, Dr. Unni, you can tell me whether uh, such industries that I'm talking about who are chemical manufacturers are also part of our uh, program uh, in this whole smart windows area. So, I think uh, uh, I'm very happy again to see that uh, uh, this is the right time for this applications. Uh, very happy to see that we are talk, looking at end-to-end -end deployment, development and deployment of these technologies. Very happy to see that industry is well connected in our programs. Uh, and only, my only recommendation is to look at also that industry which will eventually become large-scale manufacturers of, of this. Uh, and why look at only India markets? Let's look at global markets, right? And these companies should become global suppliers of, of these uh, chemicals. Perhaps we even become global suppliers of uh, smart glasses that are manufactured in, in India. Okay, So let's look at where the real value lies and what is it that India can contribute to this uh, uh, very advanced uh, applications. So with that, I will stop here and uh, I will be very happy to hear the deliberations that go in the in this iConnect event. I will also just one last thing to say, Unni, that uh, there are other laboratories in India who are also involved in it. And I'm I am aware that St. Gobain is also working with uh, one such laboratory, which is CNS in Bangalore. And I think uh, we should not uh, work only within CSR laboratories. We should also have our, uh, you know, we should embrace every other Indian R&D group which is engaged in these applications. Uh, I also happen to be on the research council of CNS. So I know the kind of very nice work that they are doing and different kinds of uh, different technologies which offer smartness to windows. Uh, so let us look at integrating with them also or bring them on board also. Right? Uh, we should look at all possibilities and some of them will uh, come up, some of them will uh, cater to certain applications, some others will cater to other applications. Uh, we should be more inclusive in the way we look at technology development. Okay, So with that, I will stop here. Thank you very much for inviting me over and happy to listen in to all the deliberations in this event. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your thought-provoking words. Uh, we are in touch with other labs, including CENS, and we promise you that we'll take your words forward. Without much delay, we shall now move on to the technical presentations. The first presentation will be by Dr. Praveen Kumar Vemuri. Dr. Vemuri is currently heading the new product development activities as, at Asahi India Glass Limited, the largest glass manufacturer in India. He is a CSIR alumnus and holds a PhD in optics of thin films from the Academy of Scientific and Innovative Research working at CSIR CSIU in 2019. With this brief introduction, I invite Dr. Vemuri for his presentation on value addition in glass, future of functionalized glass. Dr. Vemuri. Yes, sir. Thanks, Dr. Srijit, for a kind introduction of uh, my valuable biodata. And uh, I, I myself, behalf of uh, Asai India Glass Limited, I would like to thanks to all of the organizers, as well as the scientists and researchers who are going to be in, present in the present conclave. Uh, before starting my presentation, I would like to give some small glimpses of uh, Asai India Glass Limited by sharing my presentation. Can I share? Yes, please. Yeah. So coming to the topic of value addition in glass for future uh, functionalized glass components, the Asai uh, India Glass Limited basically focuses on various group of visions. Like our uh, main motive of Asai India Glass vision is making a developing developing of a smart glass windows in a low cost manner with a high quality yield product of uh, Japanese technology. So the upcoming section will be shows in, in such kind of a presentation looking for in a glazing sector as well as architectural products which are utilized in strategic sector as well as building industrial portfolio. The present technologies which was outside India Glass Limited making to develop 
such kind of products in terms of solar control as well as low e technology and upcoming the presentation goes in terms of challenges and research gaps where the scholars and scientists can work so basically the asa india glass limited is one of the largest integrated glass companies in india which it has world class products and solutions to provide for common man so the main focus of asa india glass limited for works on developing of manufacturing of safety glass for automobiles which has a current market share of 78% the company is located in four different uh, locations basically development of these four floor glass uh, plants as well as auto automotive glass plant in bawal as well as roorkee as well as taloja and chennai so coming to the asai group vision is of see more as well as see more new technologies in terms of uh, floor glass manufacturing in automotive sector as well as architectural sector so coming to the point of the architectural glass venue the asai india glass limited developed various number of technologies related to solar control low emissivity coatings electrochromic glass coatings and anti reflective coatings durable hard coat coatings durable hard Hard, hard and high reflective mirrors and bulletproof glass. So these are the value-added products we, in which uh, Sai India Glass majorly focuses for developing thin film related coating coating uh, components to to develop and to give high yield and high value added technologies in terms of common man as well as society as well as industrial applications. coming to the automotive sector the asa india glass limited developed uh, various kinds of uh, tempered and uh, annealed glass te techniques to determine the glass windows or uh, uh, glass shields where the car automotive sector can be utilized so these are our clients where our glass uh, glasses will be basically taken by other kind of partners like reliance dlf india ongc as well as uh, flipkart as well as other kind of companies so coming to the technologies where our uh, glass glasses are important uh, in which direction rasa india glass mainly focuses on tempering process of glass capability where in in which the strength of the glass can be changes from one to one similarly to increase the uh, heat or to or to decrease the heat and control the radiation from the glass we can go for lamination process by uh, tempering of two glasses or by uh, laminating of two glasses in a hard, hard and high yield manufacturing apart from that to gain different kind of coating uh, techniques the soft coat product will be is one of the important techniques in which uh, my presentation will focuses and uh, it will explains what kind of technologies what kind of developments we have focus so this is the basic uh, soft coat architectural active glazing products where asa india starts from 2010 to 2022 so the plant was started in the year of 2010 the first soft coat coated glass in terms of solar control was developed in may 2011 as well as the upcoming years 2011 the single low emissivity coating glasses has been developed by large area sputtering coating plant similarly coming to the forward of uh, double low emissivity coatings edge series as well as recently we have developed 3g type of uh, green shade glasses in which the transparency of uh, light uh in the green environment will be divided into three segments with uh, different kinds of transmission of level of ranges from 30 to 50 percent ranges so the product names which is of uh, green green building for echo fern and just these are the three important green 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 segment transparency ratio will be 30 to 50 percentage of this one so coming to the point of uh, solar control difference and low emissivity coating these are the two important major uh, uh, building segments where the uh, glasses are very important to utilize uh, uh, to uh, utilize and redu reducing the heat from the uh, incoming solar radiation from the sunlight so basically the difference between the solar control and low emissivity coating is the active component of uh, metal barrier layer is the difference 
so in the solar control coating there will not be a low emission of uh, uh, heat radiation will be very less uh, lesser as compared to the low e coating because in this low e coating the silver layer plays a dominant role to reflect the ir light by uh, the depositing a silver layer onto the onto the coated glass substrate as compared compared to the solar control product but the di major difference was the solar control coat, uh, coated product will be uh, le uh, will be reduce the sun's sun's heat towards very less less extent than the low e coating so uh, compared to the this both development utilization of these both glasses will be divided uh, in terms of uh, climate to climate or zone to zone suppose if we are in uh, in the range of south india we can go towards low e coating rather than in north india you can go by solar control coating by reduction of uh, cost optimization also so the major factors in which uh, these types of uh, technical and technological products can be concentrated on few conditions like energy consumption we in which heating and cooling and uh, lighting and uh, ventilation should be major factor we, which we will take care in developing this kind of low e and solar control products so after that the comfortness of the uh, glass in acoustic and visual performance so architectural point of view the transparency is the main important one where the internal reflection and outside reflection should control by the depositing some such, such kind of thin film coatings by using physical vapor deposition technique which is of large area sputtering technique so the portfolio of the soft coat technology comes under the sense of solar control and low emissivity low emissivity products by different kinds of product portfolio categories which is divided into sun shield enhanced edge all these three kind of developments of products will be comes under solar control category series similarly single silver and double silver coatings will be comes under the category of exceed essence and excel so all these kind of uh, development of uh, single silver coating will means they will be only one single layer will be deposited on the thin film coated glass substrate of which is a float glass uh, raw, raw float glass in the similar manner double silver means there will be a two silver layers and two blocker layers will be used to develop such kind of product coming to the stack of this uh, glass coating technologies for solar control there will be a three different layers of uh, different materials will be deposited first is of one dielectric silver uh, dielectric layer with another is a blocking layer and another one is a dielectric layer using this three layer combination we can control this uh, incoming heat radiation as seen in this particular uh, graph you can see the solar control coating is uh, reducing some sort of trans uh, heat radiation apart from the single and double low double and triple silver loes but the main important of this uh, double and sil single silver low is mainly is of uh, this metal layer which improves solar thermal performance by reflecting ir light so the point of uh, discussion of uh, this present uh, present presentation is uh, to gain uh, the to gain uh, the high energy efficiency by reducing the incoming light and by improving the internal uh, air condition without uh, uh, allowing the ir ir rays inside the building so due to during that point of conclave this kind of uh, techniques and technologies will be utilized for industrial sector as well as architectural buildings to gain high value of uh, input by reducing the uh, incoming light apart from these kind of techniques like as uh, dr ashish lile said that we, we there are electrochromic uh, co coatings and chromogenic materials also going to come so the main problem what we are facing in uh, in the industrial point of view is developing of such kind of uh, chromogenic materials onto the glass in the rugged environment where it can be withstand for future uh, utilization is one of the biggest problem which where we are focusing 
and uh, after doing such kind of glass coating of this kind of materials the main problem of electrochromic coating is that it it cannot withstand for higher uh, tempering ability or higher tempering lamination process during quenching and heating the glass after after doing the coating because the coated glass substrate as we, without annealed we cannot sell to the uh, companies or customers so we we need to withstand such kind of glass in a higher yield of temperature with the 650 degrees quenching or furnace tempering will be there so in this uh, withstand the electrochromic coatings if such kind of materials withstand mean the technique and technology which it is coming for the market will be a very and very good reliable point it will be a very important for first perspective as you see here these these are the process where the glass uh, coated glass will follow uh, once the coating has been developed by large areas patching here with the glass loading will be there cutting will be there grinding will be there after that uh, entirely drilling with respect to the specific shape then it will be glass loading into the heating and quenching then after inspection will be should be happen where industrial norms will be taken place with respect to iso en and nfrc standards so similarly these are the different process for uh, lamination as well as tempering so out of this uh, small kind of uh, presentation i founded some kind of research gaps where scholars and scientists can work towards uh, the development of uh, high yield products in hard and rugged areas with re reduction of corrosive environment, environment to protect the coated thin film layers by not affecting its optical and solar performance properties the second the main important challenge which i have taken which i have seen is that developing of coated glass or coated materials on the glass is a is one kind of task but how to control and how to produce the same thing with uh, with or without uh, affecting its performance by developing a software tool is one of the main important which uh, in industry is required suppose a developing of technology has been taken place from uh, one customer to the another or one company to another but how to utilize with a software optimization tool in which how much amount of solution or how much amount of coating layer should be deposited this is the one of the important thing which it helps to the uh, company to develop high yield of the product by regular change of jobs from one to another products the third important uh, challenge which i have seen is uh, developing of novel materials uh, by controlling solar heat evolved from the electromagnetic radiations related to the architectural and industrial building fourth challenge which i have seen is that software tool per process parameter and to reduce the error generation by when, when we are depositing one layer to the another layer and the fifth challenge which i have seen is that cost effective solutions to uh, to develop such kind of green uh, products in the categories of solar and architectural architectural sector the main and the sixth main important challenge which we are seeing is that manufacturing of glass is one of the critical uh, critical thing where high amount of energy is utilizing how to control that kind of uh, energy utilization by utilizing hydrogen gas or oxy boosting, oxy boosting technology so using these kind of techniques and technologies uh, challenges researchers or scholars can work on this one gives a very good and high yield product uh, productive environment to the industrial uh, people uh, for producing high yield of products in uh, solar control and uh, low e coating techniques some of the in house product testing facilities at asai india glass limited where we used to do all kind of rugged tests by using this kind of uh, instruments like hunter lab for uh, spectroscopic measurements and the mcut meter for ftar as well as uh, spectroscopic of uh, spectrophotometer uv visible uh, spectroscopy and uh, on on site measurement of conica minolta spectrophotometer and uh, humidity spec, uh, humidity uh, and salt spray testing will be there and uh, the glass should be passed in this uh, scrub adhesion test of 500 to 1000 cycles of uh, 
300 by 300 sample size where the glass should be withstand such kind of uh, uh, hard coating which was developed by sputtering. So here also sometimes the coating of electrochromogenic coatings will be failure. So this one of the, the one of the very important test which industry focuses is wet scrub adhesion test to promote the coating uh, adhesion on the glass whether it is withstand or not. So uh, some of the projects which uh, Asha India Glass Limited uh, completed are Trump Tower Mumbai as well as Vikram Munar Pune and Tech Mahendra Bangalore, Google Headquarters, Vizayawada Airport, Manokya and Gujarat Technical Technological University, Ahmedabad, ITC Bangalore. So I conclude my presentation by saying that uh, out of developing the developing such kind of uh, huge value added products with that a software tool also will be generated uh, to help the industrial utilize industrial people to utilize the such kind of uh, products in a very good and high yield manner thanking you thank you dr vemuri for the presentation uh, do we have any questions as far as from the audience we haven't received any question Shrijit, I have a question, Ashish Lele here. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Uh, Vemuri, very nice presentation. Thank you for uh, elucidating it. Uh, the the silver coatings that you talked about. So I, I'm not an expert in this area at all. So my questions would be very basic and naive. Uh, so forgive me for that. The, uh, the, the silver coatings that you talked about, uh, how thin are they? And are they thin enough that uh, they ensure transparency? I mean, they are below the wavelength of uh, lights that um, the, the wavelength in the solar radiation which allows light uh, in the visible spectrum to come through the, the present uh, technique uh, where we are uh, focusing to develop such kind of thin layers in angstrom level of thickness will be there right so they are thin enough that they, they don't they don't prevent uh, uh, transmission of light Yes, no, no, not a biggest problem will come uh, in the terms of transmission. Okay, all right. Great, thank you. Thanks, sir. Can I ask one question? Yeah. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, uh, Praveen, uh, very nice and very enlightening presentation. Uh, I am Bishop here from TSA and NIST. So, you know, uh, we visited uh, Asahi. Sir, I cannot audible your voice. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So I'm saying that we visited Asahi many times and we also had discussion. So during that time, uh, you know, uh, we said that because of this quenching problem, what uh, a way around is to make uh, electrochromic panels on floor glass so that it can be inserted in the inside the double glass frame, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that is one solution, but I think you are going to say that. Uh, I mean, you are uh, uh, the your concern is that if we do that, it, there is a still a cost uh, effect is there, right? It will increase your panel cost or something like that. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Rather, you want a, it is directly coated on that uh, glass itself, right? Yes. Yes. Correct. Correct. Open glass. Yeah. That, that was my question. Okay. If there are no more questions, we'll move on to the next presentation. Our next speaker is Mr. Ratish S.A., Senior Engineer, Active Glazing, St. Gobain Research India. Mr. Ratish is an experienced research engineer with expertise in building science and product innovation. He holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering with honors and an integrated master's with honors in physics from Bits Pilani. May I now invite Mr. Ratish to present on the topic active glazing for hot and humid climates. Mr. Ratish, please. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so let me just share my screen. Let me know if the screen is visible. Okay. All right, you are able to see my screen? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, having me as a part of uh, the Smart Glass Conclave. Uh, 
and to listen to people like uh, professor uh, dr ashish uh, srijit uh, and uh, um, during the introduction uh, dr ashish really brought in a very important aspect uh, where there is a lot of adoption of uh, uh, the building technologies from uh, the western countries uh, and uh, each and every region has uh, needs to have its own type of uh, adoptions in terms of the architecture it cannot be a direct copy paste uh, so that's something that we really uh, resonate uh, to uh, very well and uh, as a company uh, basically sengobains uh, vision is to make the world a better home uh, and uh, we basically try to do that by having regional specific uh, research and products so uh, i'm ratish uh, i come from sengobain research india uh so i'm part of uh, the global research team of sengobain uh where we have eight cross functional r&d centers so uh, if you actually see the screen uh so we have uh, centers across the world and two of them specifically in uh, asia one in india one in shanghai which focuses primarily on asia specific uh, research apart from uh, also on the hot and humid uh, type of research activities uh so sengobain as you guys know is a uh, a uh, 350 year old company uh, it has uh, uh, over uh, 4000 people working in research and one out of every uh, four product that is sold uh, in the past 5 years is new so that means as a company we are constantly innovating so we also keep uh, following a lot of activities on smart glazing because that's really uh, we believe that's really the future of glazing technology Uh, so uh, we spoke a lot about energy efficiency requirements uh, and how smart glazing really helps in uh, uh, sustainability aspects and other things i wish to basically bring a little different direction um, so in the past 2 3 years have been uh, really game changing for all of us with uh, covid uh, there is a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, health and wellness and if you see today architects and designers are really the agents of public health because we spend close to two third of our time uh, or in some cases it's even higher uh, in built environment so be it office or homes uh, uh, we spend a lot of time inside and uh, it really uh, is very important for the wellness of our uh, of each and every one of us if you look at globally uh the wellness market is uh, estimated uh, in about 4.4 trillion where uh, close to 0.3 trillion is about real estate and wellness itself and this number is going to continue to grow up so when you look at wellness aspect the key uh, thing people are looking for is natural light uh it really brings in a uh, lot of uh, benefits to uh, individuals and uh, Well, there was a survey that was done to understand what is the number one office perk that people are looking for is it uh, fancy slides uh, uh, or uh, is it having a excellent cafeteria fitness center all of those things but the number one amenity that people are looking for is access to a lot of natural light one in uh, so 9 and 10 people would prefer to sit near a window uh, for having natural light but most times people don't sit near a window primarily because in a country like india or uh, any hot and humid climate it is really hot near the window uh, even though we have varieties of uh, coatings uh, uh, which can uh, do a lot of solar control uh, the lowest solar control that you can go is uh, 0.24 or 0.25 percentage that means you still have one fourth of the solar radiation coming in so this is across spectrums in visible uh, and in ir so there is a lot of research uh, that has been going on in the past uh, 15 years uh, to curtail light that is uh, the uh, energy that is coming in the near ir region uh, and to maximize the uh, light that is coming in the visible region but still it is not sufficient uh, so why do why do basically buildings fail uh, in such a way most times what happens is Uh, architects have a beautiful vision the uh, the building builders uh, have a beautiful vision of a building and they would ideally like to make a building like this 
but in even invariably when you drive around you will end up seeing buildings like this so if you see the difference between the first image which i'm showing now to the second image you have blinds coming in and because of the heat invariably people are forced to pull down the blinds so what happens is when you pull down the blinds you forget uh, typically in the afternoon or in the evening you will pull down the blinds depending on the orientation and people don't even remember to pull the blinds up so what happens is all the solar control coatings and other things that you have put in basically becomes useless now all you see is a completely uh, a blind screen a blind screen that is coming down so this screen is actually on the inside surface of the building all the heat that is coming in is now trapped inside the building and this leads to a lot of energy consumption so an alternate is basically to use uh, smart glass solutions with uh, uh, dynamic solar control which can regulate the amount of heat and light that is coming in as per the sun's position so this can be done using a variety of uh, technologies and uh, uh, there are so many technologies in uh, usage in commercial usage for the past 10 to 15 years and we continue to grow on this aspect so if you just to uh, reiterate on the message here uh, manual blinds are typically at least 50% of the time they are down and if you see this image uh, this is actually a nicely designed building you see chairs are actually put uh, sofas are put near the windows and no one is really uh, sitting there and the people sitting and reading in the library space are also having a glare issue so when this is actually moved to an electrochromic kind of an uh, technology people uh, have regulated light that is coming in and heat is also controlled so today's buildings really need smart glass which are people centric uh, though we can have different type of solutions it is ultimately the people who are going to use it so people centricity is basically the most important aspect uh, so so that people can get superior comfort it also brings in sustainability and energy savings and it also brings in a lot of innovation in terms of how the operations are done uh imagine you are walking into a board room or a conference room uh for a important presentation scheduled at a particular time and uh, once you go there you see actually a lot of light you are basically spending a lot of time trying to pull down the blinds suggesting the uh lights and all of that so now in an alternate scenario where there's a smart glass you can add that smart glass as an outlook object or even as a object in any of your meeting calendars so the uh, the room knows that there is going to be a me meeting at that particular time so it automatically tilts and adjusts so that you once you are in the room you are ready to go uh so similarly uh, kind of operating on uh, having a lot of natural light and uh, natural air coming in so these are some of the different aspects a smart glass can do and that's essentially what we are uh, trying to do as a part of sengobin uh and as a part of sage glass which is a a uh, fully owned subsidiary of sengobin which deals with electrochromic glass so now just reiterating on the uh, wellness benefits of smart glass uh, so there was a study that was done in 2017 uh, uh, in a building which had uh, smart glass and uh, uh, before uh, doing a retrofit they had a regular glass so the results are quite evident there is a lot of uh, improvement in daylight because when we are going with a static glass with a high performance uh, maybe a double silver or a triple silver type of glass what we uh, do is we restrict the amount of light and heat that can come in considering the maximum scenario so that so in uh, durations when the sunlight is actually not directly shining on the glass you are also restricting it which leads to a lot of uh, uh, artificial light being used so uh, there is a lot of improvement in daylight and also in terms of occupants health that can be brought in with uh, smart glass now coming to the energy and sustainability benefits uh so uh, we spoke about net positive buildings and uh, uh, an adaptive glass is really a way in which you can really reach a net positive or a net zero uh, building 
uh, because you will save on the artificial light that is needed when uh, during the evenings. And you can also do a downsizing of your uh, HVAC system itself because it's adaptive. It is able to work uh, with the building schedule. Uh, you can also do a downsizing on the HVAC side. And even if you consider uh, like a triple silver, which is kind of the state of the art available in the market today, as compared to that, it is even more lower in terms of energy efficiency. Uh, it can save close to 16% more uh, energy as compared to a triple silver type of a glass. So now what is sage glass or what is smart glass? Uh, so it's quite simple. Uh, so we had a question uh, on can we actually use it as a part of a DGU, uh, as, a, as a part of an insulated unit. Uh, so and uh, smart glass is actually almost same as an insulated glass unit. So if you see here, the highlighted part is the electrochromic coating that comes in the inside surface. So there is a lot of challenge with respect to having a durable coating uh, that can work well for a long time. Because once you put something onto a building, we understand it needs to be durable uh, and at, it is going to stay in place at least for 20 years. So one of the ways in which we can protect it is actually have it as a part of the uh, surface four, uh, yeah, surface four where it is in the uh, insulated glass unit uh, area. Uh, so another problem is the transformation part, uh, which my uh, colleague from SI Glass uh, really highlighted. So one of the ways in which we can also tackle it is actually having a coating on a 2.2 mm glass. Uh, which is laminated with a uh, tempered glass. So this way we achieve the uh, strength and uh, we are also able to give a smart feature. In. So uh, it's quite important to have the smart glass feature, but it is also important to know how we are going to really work with it. So each and every glass now, uh, when it becomes a smart glass, it is no more just a glass but it is more of a device. Just like how each and every phone or a computer has a Mac ID, you can uh, basically have each and every glass work as a separate pixel or a separate device that goes, uh, uh, that can be controlled individually. So this essentially is connected to a control panel, which is linked to an industrial computer. Uh, thereby this entire system becomes smart. Uh, so then you can basically operate it the way you like. Uh, it can be uh, controlled using a voltage panel or a switch. You can have a mobile app based control. You can even have a BMS based control. So essentially this is where the intelligence comes in place. Uh, so each and every occupant is going to have a different priority. So it could be reduction of glare. It could be maximizing daylight or it could be uh, saving energy. Now, uh, there can be scenarios where you have a maximum demand uh, limitation and you have to reduce your uh, entire energy consumption. At that point, you can choose to basically put the entire uh, building into an energy saving mode. So based on the priorities, we do a simulation uh, to understand how the building should operate, uh, at which glasses or which floors need to be at what uh, level of performance and uh, also taking into account to the local weather, uh, to the building management commands, also people's uh, uh, manual interest and override options. Then you can also integrate it with uh, IoT devices. So with that, we do a processing and you get a dynamic control. So it's not just a glass, but it is a overall glazing solution, which leads to basically wellness of the occupants and sustainable operations. So to get into some of the details of uh, the smart glass, uh, currently uh, the lowest that people can achieve uh, today is 1% light transmission and 9% uh, solar heat gain coefficient. So uh, the same glass can actually move on to a clear state where it has 60% visible light transmittance and 40% solar heat gain coefficient. So this is kind of the spectrum at which you can work. Uh, and if you look at, there are two other tint levels. So there are various tint levels that are kept so that it becomes much more easier for people to operate. Now, if you look at an electrochromic glass, uh, 
as an analogy, you can consider it like a battery, lithium ion battery. So the electrochromic coating layer is actually a lithium ion based coating. So just like how you charge and discharge a battery, that is essentially how a smart glass works. So there is a lot of uh, chemistry and chem uh, chemical engineering uh, involved in here, uh, which uh, Dr. Lele really highlighted where we, uh, we can really take it in the application uh, area. We also need a lot of fundamental research done on the uh, material side of it, uh, where we are also taking part uh, with different uh, CSER labs, as well as uh, global labs, including NTU and a uh, few labs in uh, France as well. Uh, and uh, also there are various ways in which we are also looking to uh, work and reduce the cost of manufacturing of such devices. So one of the uh, key innovations that we are also bringing in is uh, you can and most people also want to actually go to an one person fully tint level. But what it does is it uh, basically makes the room completely dark. And especially when you have a full facade, uh, the so, uh, solar light is basically going to come from the top side. If you uh, have the bottom side is actually quite clear it would really help in terms of having an excellent color rendering index. Uh, so what color rendering index means is the space will look bright. You have sufficient natural light coming in and uh, you would uh, still be able to cut down on the overall heat that is coming in. So these are kind of the two products that we really have where you have like a classic mode uh, where you can have the complete facade actually as uh, uh, able to tint and you have a gradient mode. So uh, with this, you will be able to control the glare and also have a higher uh, color rendering index. Now coming to adoption of uh, smart glazing systems in India, uh, India is really gearing up to large adoptions. And uh, we are proud to say that India has basically the largest electrochromic installation in the world. So this project is, uh, recently uh, uh, completed uh, it's the head uh, it's going to be google's office uh, built by bagmani builders in bangalore uh, this project has close to 2 lakh square feet of uh, smart glass this is the largest in the world and the second largest is probably uh, dubai library which is uh, roughly 120 uh, thousand uh, or roughly 100000 square feet uh, which is 1 lakh square feet so uh, with these kind of uh, approaches and a lot of uh, uh, technocrats adopting smart glass, we are really going to be in the forefront of the world. So uh, one of the key things that we need is uh, basically a stronger uh, uh, work on uh, the chemistry and the chemical part of it, where we are able to transform some of these materials that will eventually help us in terms of bringing down the overall cost from an industry perspective. And uh, we are also looking at uh, how do we execute this end to end. So we have also set up a small group uh, uh, which helps people in terms of understanding this technology, uh, choosing the right kind of uh, materials, and also hand holding uh, different uh, customers in terms of executing these projects. So that brings uh, me to the end of uh, my brief talk. So I'd be happy to take questions if you guys have any. Thank you, Mr. Ratish, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, do we have any questions? We haven't received any from the audience. Can I ask a question, Sajid? Yeah, sure. Sir. Yeah, uh, very nice presentation. In fact, very mind-boggling uh, pictures and all about that Google office and all. But uh, I just wanted to ask, in the beginning, it was said that the major bottleneck in electrochromic glass, large area, glass is the conducting oxide. So is it still uh, a bottleneck or you have sold it? Already have you sold the issue? So uh, we have a working uh, method uh, by which we work uh, to be able to uh, coat in an even way. So primarily, if you look at indium tin oxide is uh, used as a conducting layer. Uh, but what happens is with the explosion of uh, smartphone industry, indium tin oxide continues to be basically a, a high cost material. Okay. Uh, 
so we are also looking at different ways in which we can have uh, alternate materials which can really uh, have a similar performance uh, and reduce the overall costing okay okay i understand thank you uh, ratish ashish lele here yes professor hi uh, two questions uh, i'll come start with the second one uh, so you know at uh, ncl we have uh, a technology to make it's probably the first in the world to make uh, silver nanowires in a continuous manufacturing process not a batch okay. manufacturing process okay uh the continuous manufacturing allows us to have very precise control on the fiber diameters uh so we can produce silver nanowires from 20 nanometer diameter to almost 150 nanometer diameters uh the process con conditions are well controlled and as i said the continuous process allows us to uh, achieve a very very nice control on the uh, wire sizes uh at 20 nanometers uh, when we coat it on our simple we don't have large scale coating facilities but when we coat it on small glass uh, panes it looks pretty transparent at least to visible eye and it's clearly very conducting uh have you tried these kinds of materials as a conducting layer uh, material uh, these are these are simple coatable formulations uh, you don't need sputtering uh, this is just a simple knife coating can be possible or any other coating methodology would be possible so uh, if you have tried it uh, and if you are interested uh, do let us know that was number 1 uh, and number 2 is uh, can you give a sort of sen sense of uh, you know for a end user uh, the economics of using uh, a smart glass a smart window i'm sure the capex is much higher than a standard window uh, and what is the roi on you know in terms of how much energy savings do you get uh, what is typically the roi for it and india being such a cost sensitive market uh, this would play i imagine a very very big role in large scale absolutely. deployment of of these applications so some sense of that would really help thanks absolutely yeah uh, thank you uh, dr ashish uh, uh so uh, to answer your first question uh, is there are ongoing experiments uh, uh, using silver nano uh, uh, materials and uh, so electrochromic is only one aspect of uh, smart glazing right like there are so many other type of smart glazing materials including uh, heated glass uh, and uh, you have various type of controls so we do use uh, these kind of uh, materials in other areas and we are also exploring them for electrochromic and we'd be happy to connect with you uh, to understand uh, more about the work that is happening in ncl and uh, uh, see what is the potential possibility of collaborations uh, okay now coming to the second question with respect to the economics uh, of uh, smart glazing yes indeed smart glazing today is uh, quite expensive uh so it could actually be 3 to 4 times uh, higher than uh, a regular uh, a high performance coating itself uh, but uh, uh, one of the things that we are also understanding from our customers uh, itself is uh, uh, the value that they are seeing in terms of uh, the reduction in uh, uh, energy and operation cost uh, is actually huge so uh, if you do an uh, apple to apple comparison by having such smart coatings you are basically uh, eliminating completely blanks which also have to be replaced every few years there is a lot of cost of maintenance of them and uh, that also adds to the energy cost because blanks is essentially not going to stop the energy from entering in so it's essentially trapping uh, the amount of uh, Uh, heat that is coming in. So an apple to apple comparison for such a smart glazing system is a complete solution, not just a glass alone. So if you consider just the glass, it is probably something like around uh, three to four times. But when we look at a complete solution, uh, it is uh, roughly about fifty percent or so more. Okay, Ratish. Uh, so uh, in this uh, capex part, which you say is about three to four times. more expensive than standard glass uh, if you were to do a sensitivity analysis of uh, various cost components which one is really the 
the biggest contributor to this uh, 300-400% more capex cost? Is it the processing part or is it the materials part? So, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, Dr. Ashish, uh, materials is basically the key area. Uh, and also processing, uh, processability of these materials. Uh, see, uh, you, you are you would be very well aware, like uh, handling materials such as lithium, they require actually a very safe, high-end processing equipment and also environment. Uh, you need to handle a lot of them in clean rooms, uh, which by itself uh, actually is a lot of uh, cost. So that's where we are also working with uh, institutes such as uh, CNS uh, to see what are the alternatives that we can really look at. And that is an area where we are uh, very much interested in doing a lot more R&D on because it really will help the overall industry grow. I would like to add one more point. Due to these kind of restrictions only, we are unable to process the electrochromic glass in a higher yield way as uh, the customers are not able to take uh, such kind of high 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 end price of products in a normal normal low cost manner as well as processing of those technologies or those techniques as an industrial side as like saying govin or asai they themselves can do such kind of technique but if we are sending such kind of product to the processor other other processor units they don't have such kind of processing technologies they the people are lagging in which how they can process the same product to the marketing purpose yes uh, you are absolutely right uh, uh, dr memory and uh, this also restricts on the transformation aspect uh, yeah. so if uh, there are uh, uh, say for example we are starting a uh, electrochromic manufacturing in india uh, it would be located in one or two places, uh, uh, I mean, across companies, like say uh, other uh, glass manufacturers are also joining in. And uh, if, even if they have their own manufacturing, it would still be located in one or two locations because scaling requires a lot of time. So that is where, uh, as in uh, uh, support from overall research aspects, if we are able to develop coatings that could be transformable without having too much of uh, restrictions on the processability, especially like if you expect processes to set up clean rooms, it is going to be quite difficult. Uh, and even in pharma industry, that doesn't happen. Like uh, you still have uh, major hubs where all the clean room activities are done. Then further down the lane, downstream, you can do processing uh, elsewhere. So this is kind of the area where we also need uh, research support uh, from eminent institutes such as CSIA. In the same way, I also requested the, the Dr. Lille. In these two categories only, we both are uh, lagging in where our own technology can go into the higher yield manner. Great. Thank you so much. Uh... I would la like to flag one more issue. I think uh, in India, one of the problem is, uh, you know, we do not have any standard size of the windows and facades. And so when, uh, yeah, when we produce glass and customize every time according to the requirement, that caters to a huge cost escalation, right? Yes, uh, Dr. Dev, uh, that's uh, basically, and uh, that's what we would like to call as a holy grail problem. If we solve that, uh, not only for electrochromic, for uh, the yield for regular glass, everything will go up. And uh, frankly, that is very difficult to standardize because uh, if I'm a customer, if I'm paying, I would like to be unique. So uh, standardizing basically becomes difficult even for an industrial or a commercial office space. Uh, so that's that's a holy grail problem, uh, Dr. Dev. And uh, if you're able to crack it uh, somehow, <laughs> that would solve uh, not just electrochromic, but whole uh, industry would change. Even, even as Dr. Dev uh, suggested, that uh, making such kind of uh, same size of glass uh, will not give high performance due to the climatic conditions also because the way the building has been constructed. With respect to that, we have to change all kind of units. How mm -hmm. the design construction, design building uh, strategy, everything will be matter. Yeah, I, I understand. The Google may afford it, but uh, you know, for common people and when we go to a mass market, it should be a policy that standardized glass size or window panel size, you know, uh, that will actually uh, make uh, a lot of difference in the presentation. Yes, absolutely. 
तो नागेश बाबू हाँ यस थैंक यू आई एम नागेश बाबू स्पीकिंग फ्रॉम सेंट्रल बिल्डिंग रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट आई होप आई एम ऑडियबल यस डॉक्टर हाँ सो आई हैव फ्यू क्वेश्चन uh specifically for uh, ratish ji regarding the you have specifically mentioned that you are working for uh, building applications so uh, in your presentation you were mentioning that the ec glasses you are generating they are giving shgc of 9% right yes that's the lowest uh... so uh, shgc 9% is like uh, uh, i don't i have never seen uh, such a type of window this soul as sgc is it any uh, have you done any major in you know, uh, some innovation or something like that okay so on the one side dr babu i would like to invite you to come to uh, sangamir research india which is located in chennai where you can see the product for yourself uh, okay. so that's the first part the second part answering your question uh, uh, so uh, professor babu like uh, if you look at electrochromic uh, way you can uh, uh imagine it as five layers where lithium ions can transfer from one layer to other layer as basic and as i was mentioning an uh, electrochromic device is very similar to a battery yes uh, so as you charge it what happens is all the lithium ions uh, come to one particular layer where uh, it blocks the amount of uh, light or uh, energy that is passing through it Uh, yeah, so, basic. Uh, I know the concept, but uh, still, I have uh, gone through so many other industries. Uh, smart window because we measure SGC here for right. uh, various industries. So we get uh, samples from various industries, but nine uh, percent is too low. That is what is uh, my question. Why? What is the specific thing you are addressing to get uh, such a low percentage? Yeah, so that's basically our uh, uh, technology where. Uh, we have a specific uh, coating combination okay. which can help us achieve so an answer so it is a, uh, you have achieved it through a new coatings or some chemical combinations right correct in the uh, in that ec layer correct okay so what is the u value of that window see u value uh, is nothing to do with the coating as you are very well aware of uh, so we do u value of about 1.5 in uh, ip units uh, okay but uh, means like that is a single glazed window you are speaking about no no uh, electrochromic i don't think so is uh, ever done in a single glazed uh, unit because uh, generally if you are looking at double glazed windows it should be u value should be less than 1 somewhere around 0.5 to 0.2 something like that uh the so u value of uh, 0.5 it could be probably achieved from an industry perspective uh in a triple uh, glazing or so uh, but generally uh, uh electrochromic glazing uh, glazing is sold as a double or a triple glaze so uh, between both the panes what what is the gas you are filling normal air or so uh, there are different options uh, dr babu so you have air argon krypton you have all these options uh okay so one more thing like uh, i am uh, i am aware that there are lot of uh, applications for offices and commercial buildings but uh, our company is targeting for residential sectors also yes uh, so there are uh, various residences where this has been used uh, uh, when uh, but most most times what happens is because of the cost difference these end up uh, being the high uh, uh, high value residences mostly villas and stuff like that mm-hmm. uh, because uh, if you look at uh, these kind no, of but, but, but for example if i speak about uh, not even in a normal uh, residence uh, normal residential buildings also windows cost will be less than uh, 1% of the total building cost right even if it increases by 3 to 4 times as you are saying uh, in your present in your this uh, question and answer session it will not make a big difference in terms of overall building cost but in terms of living experience definitely it is going to bring a lot of change so Definitely. what uh, what we are thinking is like in fact we were uh, we have applied several types of double glazing windows inside buildings and we got some very good results but uh, we are wondering why like companies are though you you may not get a uh, large volumes of orders because of residential sector because the component because the sizes are very small but still if you can uh, target in terms of residential sector actually because people spend lot of the time in residences 
though in offices i definitely agree but in your family if you see three people of your family live in the residence and uh, you also will be living in your residence on weekends also so like uh, around 70% of the time we live in our houses rather than offices so that is one sector which is uh, widely neglected in my opinion no absolutely absolutely you are right uh, dr babu dr lele may i intervene and say that uh, we'll reserve these questions for the panel discussion as we have to move to the next speaker and thank you for your cooperation the next thank speaker you, is uh, dr masimba philip uh, we know that it's an off time in the uk and we thank you for accepting our invitation and uh, uh, participate in the meeting he leads the r&d projects at glass futures in the united kingdom masimba received his phd in chemical process and material sciences at the university of leeds specializing in sustainable refractory technology for the glass industry he has more than 7 years of research and industrial experience and worked as r&d manager for psr limited before joining glass futures he has led several past and ongoing projects including the uk india lab to lab collaborative feasibility studies in glass manufacturing carbon capture technologies and their potential applications in the glass industry and hydrogen firing for ceramic materials among others with this introduction i invite dr philip for his presentation on uk india collaborations and consortia in sustainable smart glass development thank you thank you dr uh, shankar uh, and it's a pleasure to to be invited to this panel it's been interesting uh, discussions that have been had and i uh, just wanted to share with you my uh, presentation I don't know if you can. Uh, I don't know if you can be able to see. It. Yes, the presentation is visible. Could you please put in the full screen mode? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, and, uh, thank you again for for the good welcomeage. Um, just going to be discussing briefly on the. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to discuss briefly on the glass futures. Uh, just a brief introduction on uh, what glass futures, who we are, and what we do, and then talk briefly on the UK uh, India lab to lab project uh, in glass manufacturing, uh, a project that was called, completed uh, sometime in March, uh, which started uh, last year in November. And then uh, touch on the established uh, collaborative networks and uh, the next steps updates in regards to the UK India lab to lab studies. So, who is uh, Glass Futures? Uh, we were built uh, by the glass industry. So, we're made up by a consortium of uh, uh, different glass uh, manufacturers for the global gas glass industry to create, uh, to create uh, the global center of excellence uh, in St. Helens. That's where our uh, site will be based, which is near Liverpool uh, in the UK. And we want to be able to make glass the low carbon material of choice. We are a non-profit uh, membership organization. Uh, we are an RTO and we're leading the global shift towards uh, sustainable manufacturing. Uh, and uh, because of this, we do not wish to, to be involved into small improvements, but we need to have a, a disruption in terms of how glass manufacturing is, uh, is conducted uh, because not much has really changed or shifted uh, over a long period of time. And uh, with the rising energy costs, we're now looking at alternative uh, fuels such as hydrogen. Uh, we're looking at uh, more sustainable uh, glass manufacturing and uh, looking at uh, carbon capture some of the uh, projects that have been highlighted that we're looking at uh, focusing on. Other uh, projects that we're looking at uh, will be uh, in the form of um, coatings, glass coatings, uh, to be able to uh, improve in terms of uh, uh, anti-scuffing or damage resistant properties so that uh, in light weighting properties as well, so that as well uh, the, the uh, products can have a more uh, lifespan or can be reusable. So again, our flagship uh, uh, facility will be a pilot 30-day uh, ton uh, glass uh, 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 industry uh, at uh, St. Helens. So this will be producing 30, ton, uh, 30 tons uh, of glass per day. Uh, and it's a mainly a research and uh, a development facility. 
So it's an open access and it's due to be commissioned uh, in 2023. And some of the uh, technologies that we'll be looking at are low carbon fuels, uh, such as uh, uh, the use of natural gas, hydrogen, electric, uh, biofuels, as well as looking at other uh, enabling technologies that can be used uh, on the 30-day uh, uh, return uh, furnace. So we hope to be able to uh, utilize it uh, to the full aspect. It's not expected to run uh, like a normal glass uh, uh, furnace. We expect it to maybe run for the first uh, uh, session for up to maybe five years uh, because we need to be able to try out all sorts of uh, um, technologies or research and development because we understand that uh, for much of the glass companies, it is uh, difficult for them to try out uh, any new technologies on their existing uh, furnaces due to production if anything goes wrong. So we have uh, uh, decided to have a 30 day a ton uh, furnace, which won't be exactly uh, 200 or 700 ton a day uh, furnace, but it will be close and uh, much of the technologies can be trialed uh, to higher TR TRL uh, levels before it can be applied in the commercial uh, industry. Uh, this is uh, just a snapshot of uh, the plant which is uh, being constructed. It's uh, just adjacent to uh, the uh, rugby league uh, in St. Helens. And uh, this uh, photo is just to show the scale and size of the, of the plant. It's due to be commissioned uh, in early uh, 2023, where we hope to be moving in. And we hope uh, for the uh, furnace to be uh, fully operational by mid to end uh, 2023. Uh, in terms of our membership, we do have uh, quite a growing number of uh, uh, membership from industry, from uh, the universities, as well as uh, uh, the, the supply chain. Uh, for example, we do have Siemens, we've got Heineken, we've got Pilkington, Diageo, Guardian Glass, which uh, make up uh, 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 part of our, our membership for the Glass Futures, and we are growing. So we do uh, have a two-tier two system where the other one, uh, I will provide that uh, in the uh, discussion sessions. And uh, some of our key technology themes, we're looking at uh, uh, themes such as uh, secular economy enablers, uh, compositions and coatings, uh, heat recovery and carbon capture uh, demonstrations and low carbon fuels to drive uh, low carbon manufacturing, as well as uh, industry 4.0 uh, implementations, to name a few. Uh, these are some of the major projects that uh, we're currently uh, doing up to date. We've got a few uh, industrial fuel switching uh, where we've uh, been testing hydrogen and biofuels um, at uh, one of our other sister plants uh, in Liberty, Liberty Steel. Uh, in Sheffield, uh, and this is due to relocate uh, to our main site in St. Helens. Uh, a few others include, oh, sorry, a few others include uh, the BCC hydrogen, where we've been using hydrogen to fire ceramic kilns, and uh, the CCUS innovation, where we're looking working with uh, carbon capture technologies to demonstrate carbon capture on uh, glass furnaces, as well as the deep control, where we're looking at the end-to-end -end process uh, deployment. Uh, of um, digitalization uh, at one of our membership uh, plants, which is NSEC. And of course, uh, the uh, completed India Lab to Lab uh, project, where we conducted a series of workshops and uh, creation of collabor collaboration opportunities. I just wanted to put forward that uh, there has been a bit of a dialogue between the UK and India, and notably the one for the UK Energy, UK India Energy for Growth Dialogue in 2017 between our, uh, the respective uh, countries' ministers. And uh, the priorities here were uh, smart technology to improve performance and, as well as to reduce our losses, as well as to accelerate a deployment of uh, uh, renewable energy. Again, there's uh, the Green Growth Initiative where about 1.2 billion package of public and uh, private finance uh, was uh, provided to help drive India's green growth. So we are, again, uh, akin to be involved in uh, some of these uh, initiatives uh, with India. And uh, this led us to uh, the UK-India Lab to Lab uh, project for which I'll be uh, speaking on soon. So the scope of the Lab to Lab project, this was a mapping project which was funded by the UKRI, uh, UK government, uh, 
and it was just a six month project which ran from November last year and ended in uh, March to uh, this year. Uh, apologies for that. Yeah. And then uh, we, it looked at uh, three technology themes. Uh, well, one being process efficiency, energy cost, and optimization, and the other one looking at process uh, measurements, optimization, and digital uh, digitization, such as sensor technology and digital tools. And the third uh, theme was uh, waste recycling, utilization, and symbiosis. And the aims of this project was to mainly uh, develop close ties and relationships with our counterparts in India in the glass manufacturing and the R&D uh, center and to identify sustainability challenges that could be faced by uh, Indian glass manufacturers and the entire uh, supply chain, as well as to produce uh, collaborative project proposals between uh, the two counterparts. Uh, as part of uh, the project team and the support, uh, the core team uh, for, for the project was made up of uh, the UK and some of the Indian uh, industry and academic partners. From the UK, we had uh, help from the University of Leeds and uh, NSG Pickleton. And uh, our Indian partners, we had uh, help from uh, the Indian Institute uh, of Technology, uh, PGB Glass, uh, AGI Glassback, Terry, and Sepro, uh, to name uh, CNG Banerjee from uh, PGB Glass. So they did help uh, guide us in terms of uh, how we're going to go about with the project, uh, engage with uh, the relative and uh, respective uh, glass uh, manufacturers and the R&D centers in India. And uh, we also drew support from the wider Glass Futures members, as well as uh, the membership council uh, that make up uh, uh, the glass, uh, glass Futures membership. And the approach we adopted was initially, we wanted to identify the industry needs and the challenges and to look for existing solutions to identify if and how they can easily be adapted uh, to meet those needs. And where no solutions exist, we would run our ideation sessions and to develop our research and development plans to try and create uh, some of the solutions. And uh, for the lab to lab uh, UK India project, this was mainly uh, led by the uh, Indian industry and uh, would we were to Going to prioritize opportunities with the biggest impact. And then from this, we hoped to uh, form uh, the strongest possible collaborations to work on these uh, solutions and help uh, as well source funding to develop and to, to deploy uh, these solutions. So for, for the project, we, uh, as I think highlighted by uh, Dr. Uh, uh, by our panel members, uh, Dr. Uh, Ashish as well, where he highlighted that uh, instead of just looking at uh, one single uh, process uh, operation, we looked at the entire end-to-end -end process. So right from our raw material procurement, right up to uh, the end user, uh, beyond the end user rather, right up to recycling uh, of, of the glass product. And uh, for this, we developed a questionnaire for interviews, which covered uh, the sustainability challenges that may be faced across each of the end-to-end -end process of the glass manufacturing. Uh, we interviewed, conducted a few interviews with uh, some of the representatives from the glass manufacturing, uh, glass processing uh, co companies, OEMs, and uh, the research and development centers and institutions and the supply chain. And we held two workshops. Uh, one was held in uh, February and the other one in uh, March, where we conducted ideation sessions to try and come up with solutions to some of the challenges that we had uh, uh, acquired from uh, uh, the one-to-one -one interviews and uh, uh, a questionnaire that we had with the glass manufacturers. So uh, from those uh, ideation se uh, sessions, we came up with uh, 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 proposed ideas and solutions from these workshops, uh, which were then grouped into the relevant uh, technology themes uh, of process efficiency, energy costs, or process measurements and optimization and digitization and waste recycling and uh, utilization. And uh, these groups were then uh, 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 mapped into or abstracted into project proposals. And then uh, further, these project proposals were refined through collaborative uh, uh, networking between Glass Futures, UK and uh, India R&D collaborative partners. And uh, we, again, further uh, developed this into pro uh, project proposals. 
Uh, this is just a, a list of uh, some of the project uh, concepts or proposals or themes that uh, came out from the, uh, the UK India ideation phase. Uh, so we came up with a, about nine concepts uh, and uh, some of them looked at the Nova wells to uh, improve waste glass and colored recycling and management right up to uh, Nova refractory uh, or material technologies for current and low carbon fuels for uh, sustainable glass manufacturing as well as uh, the end-to-end -end digitalization optimization using uh, AI uh, tools for sustainable glass manufacturing, as well as uh, low carbon fuels for sustainable glass manufacturing. Sorry. So based on this um, feasibility study that we had in the ideation phase, we created um, or had rather more than 50 new UK, uh, India, uh, networks and uh, shareholder connections. And uh, from the Indian side, as you can see, uh, we had co quite a, a bit of uh, a networking uh, with uh, Dr. Deb and uh, Dr. Shankar, uh, and is all included in this where uh, Dr. Alex uh, P. James from uh, Digital University of Kerala, as well as uh, Bharat Kale from uh, CMET. And uh, um, as well from SEPRO, RKS, Kuma, including as well some of the uh, glass uh, uh, companies uh, in India. So we formed these uh, collaborative networks and uh, we will be continuing to uh, nature these uh, 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 networks. And as part of the exploitation plan, um, the outcomes of the project were fed back to the Indian and the UK government to help shape uh, the future collaborative funding strategies and this will be used to engage other partners across the global glass industry. In the short term, uh, we look to identify opportunities for commercially funded collaborative R&D opportunities uh, between the Indian glass manufacturers as well as the R&D organizations, and to try and explore opportunities for partners from India and the UK to get involved in uh, existing projects that we are currently working on as well as to get support from uh, Innovate UK and uh, to support Innovate UK and our Indian counterparts to develop their next phase of our projects and funding, as well as to continue the networking and the uh, partnership development activities. Uh, in the long term, we look to identify opportunities again for grant funded uh, collaborative R&D opportunities and to continue to develop and grow the collaboration between the UK and the Indian glass manufacturers. And uh, we hope to be able to have a glass futures footprint uh, in, in, in India or an equivalent. Because what we are highlighted or understood was uh, much of the glass industry in India is uh, fragmented. I guess there needs to be a, a sort of like an organization that can pull people together to, to come and uh, have uh, pre competitive uh, collaborative uh, ideas and networking and sharing because uh, unless we do that, uh, we will we'll not uh, develop any further. Uh, the ne next uh, key steps and updates that I can provide uh, that came out from, from uh, the UK India uh, project was uh, there will be a bilateral funding calls uh, with India, and this will include a multi partner feasibility studies with India and the UK industry uh, and research organizations. Uh, this for the first two years, this will be uh, for the duration of 12 months uh, for each year. Uh, this is expected to commence uh, from summer 2023 to 2024. Uh, I will be providing further updates on this. But uh, from UKRI, they advised us that I think 10 million uh, pounds had been set aside for the first two years, which will increase as we go on. Uh, there will be a virtual networking event in September, which will officially launch uh, the report from the Global Expert Mission uh, in India and the lab to lab projects uh, uh, that, that were conducted between the UK and the India counterparts. Uh, and I think of more importance is the inward trade mission visit to the UK, to, uh, which, will, uh, which was expected to initially occur in uh, October this year, but this has been now delayed to. Uh, early January uh, next year. And uh, from this, we'll, we are expected to host about 30 Indian uh, delegates, 20, which I understand will be coming from uh, the industry, and uh, 10 will come from uh, the uh, research institutions, IIT, uh, and uh, uh, ministerial members. And Glass Futures have been uh, uh, requested to, to host uh, one of those uh, 
two stop visits. So the first stop will be um, in the Northwest, which will host uh, and we've uh, included our uh, Liverpool uh, uh, region center to be able to help us with the hosting. Uh, and then the second stop will be in uh, Midlands in Coventry at, uh, at the MTC. And then uh, towards, uh, again, this has been uh, pushed back, but initially it was set for the end of November to the 3rd of December. There was going to be an outward mission to India with uh, UKRI uh, G uh, Global Business uh, Innovation Program to take uh, the UK SMEs to India uh, to look at uh, the Indian uh, industry and to be able to uh, begin discussions around uh, project proposals. And some of those projects are the ones that I highlighted earlier. Again, this will be uh, advised as it's been delayed. Initially, it was set to uh, or to commence on the 26th of November to the 3rd of December this year. Thank you. And that's it for my time. Uh, I don't know if anyone has got any more questions. I'm happy to take those. Thank you, Masimba, for the detailed presentation on possible Indo-UK collaborations. Uh, do we have any questions? We have time for a couple of questions. Shrijit, can I ask? Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Hi, Masimba. Very, very nice presentation. I was not aware of this. I hope uh, our CSR labs are connected with uh, this network, uh, and I think uh, you should certainly pitch for the uh, the inward and outward, uh, you know, visits uh, between India and UK. Uh, certainly must you know it would be important to become part of this uh Masim, but two two three questions from my side um uh, yes, uh, was there an initial funding from the uk government to kick start the glass futures or was it completely from industrial uh, uh, consortium oh no it was uh, initially from uh, the government i think the government were the ones that uh, provided the initial uh, funding from UKRI, they provided about eight million uh, pounds, and uh, we were lucky as well that uh, Liverpool, uh, the Liverpool uh, city region, uh, also offered to uh, to match that funding. Uh, given that uh, we we had uh, uh, identified Saint Helens as, uh, as a site where we we wanted to have this uh, thirty day turn uh, site. So they offered that, and uh, there were a few other uh, government uh, uh, organizations that uh, pitched in. And then from there, we did have uh, a few uh, glass companies that uh, ended up uh, uh, coming in into the fold and uh, getting into the uh, membership and uh, supporting uh, uh, the, the development of glass regions. But yeah, it started from a, a government uh, initiative. Okay. Uh, and is the membership open to uh, companies outside UK? I mean, uh... Are you oh, welcoming? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, because uh, Glass Features, uh, while it's uh, it started in the UK, we don't see ourselves as a UK organization. We see ourselves more as a global uh, uh, company. We are there to, 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 to serve and uh, try and uh, uh, meet all uh, global glass uh, companies to come into the fold and the entire uh, supply chain. Because we believe that uh, through collabor collaboration, only we can be able to you know to to achieve things because much of the uh challenges that most of the companies face are pretty much pre-competitive and if we all put uh, our heads together we can be able to you know to, to to solve some of these sustainable challenges so we do uh, for example in our uh, membership we do have uh, many companies like uh flood glass companies as well as container glass companies uh in terms of uh, uh melting of the glass they all share the kind of the, the same uh, refractory technology and challenges. So, I mean, it, it's, 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 there's no reason why they should all come together for some of these pre-competitive uh, challenges um, right. to be able right. to meet some of these uh, sustainable challenges that they face. Yeah. So yeah, uh, it is open to, to, to anyone. Uh, and uh, yeah, we are more than open, uh, open to, to, yeah, to welcome anyone uh, from, from outside UK. Okay. Uh, is it a part of Catapult or is it outside of the Catapult uh, uh, At the moment, we are just outside of the Catapult, but we, we are working towards that. Uh, so, yeah, we, we are working towards that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just two technical questions, Masimba, if you can. Uh, yes, sure. I'm interested in knowing how, well, roughly on average, 
how much kg co2 per kg glass is 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 uh, emitted in the glass manufacturing companies in in the process is, is there a number i know there are different types of glasses so emissions would differ from variety but on an average per ton of glass how many tons of co2 is emitted oh uh i, I think i'll i'll have to be able to come back uh, to you on that uh, in, okay. in, in in that regard yeah i don't have the exact uh, numbers yeah, on maybe it. this uh, question is open to to others as well and a parallel question on uh, is on circularity you uh, i think the glass future seems to have a lot of focus on circularity so uh, a yeah. general question is uh, what is the circularity status of glass today uh, and are there adverse effects on circularity when we bring in smart glasses because of so many layers and other materials that go in the glass does that adversely affect the circularity yes i think it does uh for the container glass there isn't really much of a problem you tend to find uh, container glass it's easily recyclable uh, recyclable but when it comes to float glass uh, because of uh, uh, um, uh, the processing that's done on it, it it's there, is, there has been a challenge in terms of uh, its its re, its recyclability, but uh, that is something that we are uh, currently looking into uh, to looking into technologies or uh, research and development that can be able to improve that. And as as you highlighted, uh, for some of the smart glasses because of the additive uh, materials um, that are uh, uh, placed in, in in the processing of the glass. That can have as well again uh, adverse effects in it being uh, being being able to be recycled, because uh, uh, in terms of uh, the production of the glass itself, uh, just uh, for a minute uh, amount of uh, uh, contaminants, who can can be able to spoil the glass. So again, we're looking at uh, technologies that can be able to uh, better improve uh, the recyclability of especially float glass, because I think. At the moment, it's quite low in terms of percentages. I think it's less than uh, uh, forty percent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Masimba, for the wonderful presentation. And now we'll move to the next presentation. Will be given by Dr. Vishwabriya Dev from CSIR NIST. Dr. Dev is a principal scientist at CSIR NIST. He holds a PhD in material science from the Indian Association for Cultivation of Science. He had a few postdoctoral stints before joining CSINist, one at the University of Minnesota, another at the University of Louisville, both at the United States, followed by a stint at the National Institute for Material Science in Japan. He joined CSINist as a senior scientist in 2012. And now invite Dr. Dave to present on the major contributions from CSIR in the area of smart glass technologies, particularly for energy efficiency. Um, is my slide visible? Yes. Uh, respected director, uh, Dr. Lele, and uh, member dignitaries, uh, I will present a status of uh, CSI developed smart glazing technologies on glass that is mainly developed uh, using funding from our energy team in CSIR. We have several themes in CSIR, uh, including energy, chemicals, and materials. So uh, this is this presentation is mainly what we developed under the energy team. So this slide is a bit of superfluity because, uh, because of the discussion that we already have. And uh, the left panel uh, shows some values of uh, the energy utilization in India. So I think in the current years, we are uh, using about 1400 terawatt hour energy per year. And out of that, 40% of total energy goes to indoors, goes to power indoors. And uh, that also, we talk about electricity, that is about 73% of the electricity and 35% of natural gas. And, and the situation is going to be dire because uh, we are witnessing the biggest human migration in the planet, as uh, Dr. Lele uh, already mentioned. And uh, by 2030, it is projected that around 60 crores of population will be living in the uh, Indian cities. 
in urban areas of India, and that is almost 8% of world's population. So you can see that what uh, the challenge lies in front of us. To counter this, uh, Indian government floated uh, many, uh, many, you know, missions, and one of them uh, is smart cities mission that requires smart solutions like this glaze in technologies and all. And uh, the main idea is to come up with smart houses. And uh, Niti Aayog, with the help of uh, CSIR CVRI, uh, Dr. Nagesh and Dr. Kishore is here, uh, with uh, inputs from CSIR CBRI, already proposed a roadmap for fast tech adoption of this energy conservation building code uh, in urban and local level. So that requires also, you know, contributing technologies from Indian scientists. Uh, this is what uh, a window in a building, when you talk about, you know, energy conserving building, this is what a window contributes. It, uh, you know, uh, it, it affects around 50% of energy transmission and it is also 30% of the energy that goes into indoor got, uh, got bursted uh, because of the inefficient windows. So therefore, we need smart glazing technologies as a, all the speakers were, have pointed out. And uh, these are some of the market projections uh, that how uh, the, the market for smart glass is growing in different sectors. And uh, this is also a, how it distributed, distributed region-wide. So coming to the timeline that of this uh, fast track development of glazing, glazing technologies under the energy team. So we started, uh, you know, this activity uh, in a very small laboratory level in 2014-15, and it is taken up by CSI energy team around 2018. And then uh, first came scaling up of, you know, leading materials and components. And then now what we are doing is to, you know, uh, we are standardizing the material and also uh, doing the life cycle analysis. And uh, it is by 2024, uh, CSIR NIST is, uh, you know, uh, collaborating with uh, CSIR CBRI and CSIR CSIO for field trials. Uh, field trials will happen at CSIR CBRI. And uh, just like uh, Dr. Praveen was mentioning, uh, CSR CSIO will develop instrumentation for the smart windows and also uh, uh, they will make IoT based control uh, control systems uh, for the smart, smart smart windows so that you can uh, you know uh, control all the uh, your uh, penetration system by using your cell phone and all that so uh, that is we plan to finish it by 2024 and then make a white paper on uh, energy saving, uh, cost, uh, the, you know, cost calculation, and cost recovery of our technology. So coming to active glazing, uh, that is mostly electrochromic systems. It is a sandwich cell type of structure with multiple layers. But uh, as uh, uh, Rajesh has pointed out, this is just like a battery. So what we are planning to do is uh, when we are charging, you know, the, we are storing charge in this windows from a battery or solar cell and that will switch the color. And when we discharge it, we discharge, we are planning to discharge it through a load. Okay, and uh, the discharging rate by changing the material and do some engineering, we can change the, we can tune this discharging rate to be battery-like or capacitor-like uh, according to the user requirement and then uh, reuse that energy. And that will increase the efficiency of energy further and it will bolster you know, uh, much more efficient devices. And we have visited many industries and we adopted that industry friendly processes for uh, you know, all of our processes are wet chemical processes and uh, the fabrication are uh, made by spray coating, screen coating, uh, printing and uh, by screen printing and uh, you know other deep coating. So this kind of industry uh, friendly processes. And this is one of the examples that how uh, we can make a uh, very, uh, you know, very, very high quality electrochromic device. Uh, we are, uh, right now we are limited to one feet by one feet. 
but you know this is only instrumental limitation in, in principle we have developed processes that can go to any size intensity so we have a many other system electropolytronic system whereby changing uh, voltage you uh, can get different colors if that what what you want in your windows uh, we can provide that we can also provide, uh, this is our patent technology, we can also provide multifunctional system that has multiple modes. And by changing the voltage, you can actually, uh, you can actually select a spectral range and that can give you many modes of operation. Like if you want to block, uh, block uh, heat without blocking uh, the visible clarity, that is possible. You can also uh, go vice versa you can also slightly dim your windows or you can go to full privacy mode and uh, uh, you know you can uh, these windows store a lot of charge and that is been shown in this table and those charge can be recovered uh, in a battery like fashion or capacitor like fashion depending on the application There are other systems like uh, the first system. This is the organic electrochromic system. I'm only showing uh, some uh, small devices in here, but uh, you can see that almost uh, this shows almost transparent state to a almost black state, uh, which is very important for uh, many applications, uh, creating an organic black uh, electrochromic system. There are uh, metallopolymer based PC for electrochromic formulation, which can be printed or spray coated on any kind of substrate, including flexible substrate. We can create uh, various patterns, switchable patterns with this. You can see uh, there is a multicolor switching is possible uh, on flexible substrate using this metallopolymer based uh, formulation. We developed uh, we developed our own electrolyte uh, that can go in these devices, and uh, these are very very stable. And if we make a device, it can go on years. Uh, that we, we tested and with no degradation. So both solid, semi-solid gel electrolytes are available. And since electrolyte uh, preparation is a problem, we also are now using natural extracts. Uh, for green electrolytes, which is uh, now showing superior electrochromic performance, and which we'll bring out later. Uh, we have special electrolytes, like this is a functional gel electrolyte that can uh, give you very fast switching, probably not for, uh, not required for uh, a window, but for our mirror. But this, uh, this kind of systems are available. And we can also, uh, uh, we also have a uh, process uh, for making uh, conducting substrates using the spray pyrolysis system uh, inside CSI NIST. And in other labs, we have, like Dr. Lele already mentioned, we have a uh, silver based system or uh, aluminum to sedano based systems in many other CSI labs. So uh, basically, you can, in CSI, you can get the whole nine years uh, for any, any kind of this smart building technology. And, uh, you know, coming to the benchmarks, uh, we have some, we have started with some industry specifications. Now, uh, you can see in the right side that we have systems that uh, outperforms whatever we are started with. And we right now have much better systems that can be supplied to industries. And we also have the state of the art facilities for making electrochromic devices, except the, you know, the uh, highly accelerated light testing measurement, we have all the facilities in place. Also, uh, light testing measurement system, uh, we will, uh, we are uh, very soon. This is a passive blazing technology, a thermochromic technology. So uh, these devices are fabricated with filling a special uh, liquid formulation between two normal uh, silicate glass panels. Okay, and uh, this uh, device operates on the basis of lower critical solution temperature. So you have to target temperature, a critical temperature, let's say 30 degrees. So above and below that temperature, you can go at a fully transmissive public state, and uh, above that temperature, you can get a completely private state. 
So in here, you can see that device uh, color is white, but uh, uh, you can use different dyes to make different color windows that we already have uh, several of those examples in our lab. And this is a benchmarking that you can uh, reduce up to six to seven degrees uh, temperature using this system. We also have metallopolymer based thermochromic system and with uh, different temperature, you have different opacity in here. You can create completely transparent to, uh, you know, various opacity level you can crack uh, using temperature. So, uh, the advantage of this system is, uh, it, first of all, it doesn't require a, a conducting glass and that is, I think, a huge cost reduction. And uh, uh, you can use uh, pre-existing glasses. Again, uh, this is a very important thing because glass waste generation is a major factor using, you know, you, we need some, retro, uh, some technology that can be retrofitted with the existing glass and that will be a uh, huge value addition. And this kind of technology can provide that. And in, uh, it is also possible to, you know, integrate this technology with electrochromic technology to uh, come up with more efficient uh, energy saving. We have uh, passive glazing technology like photochromic systems, and we can, these are uh, different from what we apply on our glasses. So these are mostly for the energy purposes. And what we intend to do is use this system uh, in tandem with the electrochromic system. So we'll make a photoelectrochromic kind of devices and that can uh, actually uh, increase your device efficiency ultimately. And uh, this formulation can be coated on many uh, substrates like fabric and uh, paper. And we also have uh, multicolor photochromic systems. Again, uh, we can uh, make freestanding films and we can cut into any size. And again, it can be applied on paper and fabric. So uh, this is uh, in a nutshell that what uh, uh, CSIR is doing to foster smart living. We have uh, different technologies like dynamic windows, solar modules, efficient lighting, uh, energy storage, smart flooring, waste heat harvesting, indoor light harvesting, self-sustaining devices, and smart architectural planning all come together uh, to make a net zero or net positive building. Uh, and uh, that is the vision that we started with that uh, by 2030 or uh, around that time, we should have this technology in hand, all this technology and all. So these are some uh, developed uh, products and processes for business. We have technologies for active and passive dynamic windows. We have many new materials available for working and counter electric coating. We have inorganic, organic, and hybrid components and inks, uh, different types of electrolytes, including liquid, gel, solid, and naturally extracted electrolytes. And this technology, because of the commonality of operation, we can have many other energy devices like non emissive displays, online monitoring system, e tag, signage applications, and e papers. Uh, uh, CSIR offers services like collaborative technology development, technology transfer, IP and licensing. Uh, IP licensing. Uh, we also, you know, take joint projects and ventures. Uh, we offer consultancy and uh, sponsored services uh, to the customers. We, uh, some of the labs are involved in validation and certification, and uh, of course, one-to-one -one discussions and custom solutions. And then uh, coming to skill development, we have many PhD students and project students are working in the smart class sector. And uh, such skill sets, I think, uh, is readily available to the industry uh, for product and process development. And uh, we know that there is a gap between, uh, you know, industry and academia exists in India much more than the other places, other uh, industrial countries. But I think. Uh, like a example is Dr. Praveen. So if we, if uh, CSR trained personnel can get a place in the industry, uh, they will definitely, I believe, can uh, bridge the gap that exists between CSR and industry, and uh, both would be beneficial uh, in this regard. And 
there are many other labs we just showed some example uh, that is happening in the you know with, with the energy trim uh, project but there are many other labs that are involved in all of this so uh, if you contact the moderators and we will uh, definitely connect you to the right person so thank you so much for your attention thank you dr dev uh, we have time for a couple of questions if there are any Dr. Dave, I have a small question uh, on uh, the glass substrates which you have quoted for uh, this kind of different kinds of color shades. Do you right. did any kind of experiment that uh, all different kinds of shades by keeping one to one each other by changing the potential by seeing how that change of effect of color shade is happening or any kind of only one pattern like a series number of glasses? You, you mean to say by uh, with different glasses or the same glasses? The same, same supports we are taking a one, one product which, uh, which is having a color shade of green shade. So taking that one as a multiple components of the same shade, keeping one to one each other, looking like a glass facades type, how the shade variation is varying from one to one by the change in potential voltage because the customer will see the outside view of the building should be in the same same color in one time with the change right. in potential how mm -hmm. and in what way the color changes is happening this is quite homogeneous but uh, i understand your point uh, in the large scale when we talk about you know there is no point of uh, because of uh, why i am asking this question because no, of I this understand. change I understand. I, we already thought about it I understand. Uh, that is what uh, we are going to do when we are doing the field trial, because this coloration homogeneity should be there if we go for you know multiple systems, right? Yes. So, yeah, and uh, the coloration efficiency and all that that efficiency values and current values are same. If we can uh, you know make your coatings very homogeneous and all that, uh, but still, uh, if any uh, you know. Uh, if any deviation is there, uh, we should have electronics to correct it. And uh, that, that is also this one is the one very, the very... Yeah, I, I, right. So that is also one of the factors uh, we discussed with CSIO, so that any compensation is required for any glass because it should, uh, you know, it should control the entire window system. Uh, so any uh, deviation is there, it should be compensated through software. Okay, okay, good. If there are no more questions, uh, let me thank all the speakers on behalf of the organizers. And now we'll be heading towards the panel discussion for the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, we have all the speakers available for panel discussion. Uh, and apart from that, we have Dr. Nagesh Babu and Dr. Kishore Kulkarni from uh, representing CSIR CBRI and Dr. P. Sujada Devi, who is a chief scientist at CSIR NIIST, and Dr. Narayan Nunni, who is the vertical leader for energy conversion technologies in the E2D theme. To start with the panel discussion, may I ask the first question to Dr. Sujada Devi. Uh, Madam, could you please switch on your video? Uh, one of the questions is about an end-to-end -end solution in smart glass technologies. What do you think is missing in an end-to-end -end technology in the development of smart glass technologies? And how do you think CSIR can be a bridge, an effective bridge for this gap? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. So this question is uh, towards me, no? Yes, madam. Okay. I first of all let me congratulate all my colleagues for organizing such a wonderful uh, industry meet, especially with respect to smart glass, with participation from two major partners like uh, Asahi Glass and Saint Gobind. So thank you very much for 
being here with us uh, with CSAR colleagues, he said how we can take this technology forward. Now, with respect to this end to end solutions, what we have seen with our experience in CSIR, probably the major hurdle could be the having indigenous technology on coatings, where this large area coatings can be developed, as you mentioned, without maybe this uh, uh, clean room facility. That could be one hurdle scientists could think of uh, having maybe systems or uh, materials which can be coated in the industrial specifications in a facility which anyone can afford to. That could be one solution we should think of very seriously. And second point, I feel with respect to the conducting coating, the substrate which you mentioned. As uh, I know very well in India, no one makes this uh, uh, conducting oxide glasses uh, in our country. Uh, in fact, CSIR, we had some efforts in developing this kind of uh, coatings. In fact, at NIST, we had a major program from CSIR energy team on developing such coatings. Uh, but I don't know, we have to see like what is the requirement with respect to smart glass technology, the kind of sheet resistance you people are looking for, what is the transparency required, and also the cost aspect, of course, one has to think about. Uh, so we also would like to hear from the industry partners as well, uh, whether any uh, this electrochromic coating technology is available in our country uh, with respect to whatever the presentations and projections you have uh, put forth in this discussion. Uh, is, is there a technology available in the country? I am putting the question to you, uh, uh, Dritish. Uh, your presentation was wonderful, but the question came to my mind is whether uh, we have an indigenous uh, technology available for electrochromic coatings, especially on large area substrates that too with cost effective manner where you don't need maybe a clean room facility. And what could be your thoughts on this? Uh, if you could share with us uh, we will be ready to take uh, such activities forward. Sure. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Sujata. Like, uh, this is uh, basically a key uh, research requirement today as well. And uh, you are right in pointing out that there is no indigenous uh, facility where we can get these kind of conductive coatings. Uh, 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 it's not just an ITO, if uh, ITO, FTO, or okay. even uh, silver nano, uh, some in silver coatings uh, on a large scale for a conductive surface. See, uh, and uh, in my view, we are actually on a right track to get something of that sort because uh, it has to be trans industry um, with a lot of uh, importance coming in for sustainability uh, and India as a whole uh, looking to become uh, carbon neutral by 2070. There will be a huge uh, push on uh, having our own uh, individual indigenous photovoltaic manufacturing units where an industry such as photovoltaic also requires some sort of a conductive coating yes and also with respect to mobile manufacturing as well like uh, uh, with large industries setting up uh, uh, um, rather than uh, rather than not depending on imports but yes. more uh, making uh, uh, with atmanil bar make in india so there will be uh, what we also foresee is uh, there in a few years down the lane, there will be industries starting to offer these kind of coating technologies, uh, which are going to be trans industry. Because if we just take building glass, building glass will be a small part of it. Uh, uh, and uh, it will be mostly driven by solar is uh, what we anticipate. Now, uh, I also would like to know whether, uh, uh, you know, whether uh, St. Gobin is ready to make a tie-up with CSIR to develop such technologies. We do have something already with us. Starting from there, could we take it forward to the next level? Yeah, no, definitely. So we are also looking out for uh, academic collaborators and uh, partners. Uh, for example, uh, we re recently had uh, Dr. Gayatri from Dr. Le Dave's lab join us. Uh, she yeah, was yeah. uh, aware of it. Yes. So uh, we are also looking to start uh, developing uh, some of these uh, partnerships as well. Uh, so we can definitely work on this. Uh, I'll set up a separate discussion with you and Dr. Deb, and uh, we can figure okay. out uh, what are the areas we can work together. 
one more point in fact we had another industry meeting June where the uh, basic aspect was for self cleaning coatings for photovoltaic application so uh, doctor you uh, uh, i was not able to hear no, we had another industry college meet last month in the month of June. This was with respect to self-cleaning coatings and its applications. Uh, Dr. Indranil from St. Gobin was uh, our uh, in invitee for this program. So he also showed interest in developing the self-cleaning coatings for St. Gobin. And I am thinking of having a meeting with them. So maybe if we could have a uh, program or uh, uh, MOU for the entire coatings, what is your requirement if we can make a MOU with CSIR to take up this coating technology forward, that would be great. Definitely, ma'am. We'll follow through all that. My second point was whether do we have any indigenous technology for electrochromic coatings in the country? Uh, I'm aware of it in lab scale, not okay. uh, at a uh, large industrial scale. Uh, so, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sure you are aware of Dr. Deb's uh, yes, work yes, yeah, very well. Yes, our, uh, uh, our uh, division only. Yeah, and uh, CNS, uh, Center for Nano and Soft Materials, uh, Professor Michael. Kulkarni, yes, yes. Uh, is also uh, working on, uh, I think he's now JNCSR, but anyway, like uh, related to uh, similar industry. So, I think uh, he is also uh, involved in some of these activities. So. We are aware of a uh, few of them in the lab scale, but not on an industrial scale. Uh, okay. And uh, what is your thought about uh, flexible electrochromic uh, substrates? What is the future of flexible electrochromic systems? Now we are talking about basically coatings on glass, right? Right. Um, so flexible electrochromics uh, are, uh, uh, I, I think the application needs to be uh, also explored more. Uh, see, well, what we have seen in the past, which is uh, flexible electrochromics being applied in uh, uh, bottles and containers. Okay. And uh, there could be applications uh, with respect to uh, medical devices. Uh, so that's what we are aware of. So even we are also looking at uh, flexible electrochromics, uh, what are the different applications that it can really bring in. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question is probably to uh, Dr. Vemuri. Since Asahi works on different types of glass, particularly for automotive applications as well. More than 90% of automotives in India use Asahi glass. How do you think the market vary in terms of architectural or automotive applications of smart glass, which would be easy to commercialize, which would have a better market? Why this question came was because uh, there are several experts who comment that the application of smart glass in automotive industry, which is more of a high end industry, is much more facile as compared to a domestic or commercial building. So what do you, what are your ideas on uh, commercialization prospects of smart glass for the architectural and the automotive industries? So coming to the point of the conversation on uh, automotive sector, basically uh, as a leader of uh, automotive, automotive section of Asahi Glass Limited, they are focusing basically on sunroof technology for the cars. The sunroof technology is coming up in a booming one in terms of uh, architectural point of view or uh, reduction of uh, glare or uh, reduction of heat in entering in the, inside the car. This is the one of the most important technology where the industry wants to focus uh, on sunroof technologies. So coming to the industrial uh, sector of architectural building side, the similar manner where uh, not only for building, even if you see for metros, if we are using such kind of glass facade, facades or glasses which is having DG nature or SU nature in the metro, we are unable to get uh, network signal properly. So how and in what way we can overcome the network connectivity inside the metro train by giving some kind of uh, antenna or antenna type coating on the coated glass 
where it can generate some kind of uh, uh, signal generation from the outside uh, uh, without entering without passing the heat so that is one of the technology you can develop in such a, in, in such terms thank you uh, another important aspect of the smart glass technology Forgive, uh, can i yes, ask yes, question? yeah uh, dr pravin Yes, sir. So, for this uh, sunroof technology in car. Uh, uh, basically, sunroof the... technology there they were going to use uh, some kind of transparent solar panel uh, or photovoltaic uh, phenomena where uh -huh. it can utilize uh, both both ways. It can be possible. Right, right. So I was thinking that uh, probably uh, more than electrochromic, thermochromic. Uh, systems, maybe solid state thermochromic coatings without any moving parts would be a better suit, uh, better suit for that, those kind of uh, systems, right? Yeah. Another important aspect when we talk about the smart glass technology, particularly for the domestic sector, is that if we do not integrate the developed smart glass to buildings, then the application part will still be in the dark. So. The questions are to uh, Dr. Nagesh Babu and Dr. Kishore Kulkarni. What are the challenges towards achieving uh, building integrated smart glass technology? Or how could we get to project the energy saving and payback period for such building integrated technologies? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, so uh, with respect to uh, the question that uh, how we can able to analyze uh, the effect of smart classes uh, utilizing the building and with respect to its analysis, is it right? Yes, how can, how can we project this hello. because people will be looking at some sort of uh, energy savings or payback period. So one part of the question is how can we project it to the public that uh, there will be a payback period and this will be the savings. How can we convince them? The second is what are the actual challenges associated with integrating these smart glass technologies to the buildings? Uh, so with respect to first question, uh, uh, so uh, thing is, uh, we can able to do the simulations uh, that is uh, with respect to the experimental uh, thing is the one thing. Another is that with respect to simulations, we can able to find out the, what is the energy consumption is there without using the smart glasses and after using the smart glasses. That is the one thing. So for that, the test bed facility is uh, required to establish so that we can able to uh, consider these different classes and we can able to conduct the experiment. So in the presentation, I was uh, supposed to ask question to the industry persons that uh, they have mentioned that they have done some kind of simulations wherein uh, they have mentioned that the energy saving is done. So, uh, so here in CBRI, we also do conduct the experimental work and also uh, we do simulations also. But here, uh, what the problem is with respect to simulation is uh, the climatic uh, the weather data files that we cannot able to get the the respective dates we can get with respect to the older climatic data so there will be a variation with respect to the experimental results and the the simulation results so uh, that is what uh, one uh, the problem is there with respect to simulations so uh, that particularly uh, maybe industry persons also they are maybe using some different softwares also will uh, gives the different different results so that is the one uh, the uh, the uh, research oriented that is the one problem is there another with respect to the how we can convince to the people that uh, based on the however there may be a simulation results or the maybe experimental results which can clearly indicates that uh, after using this particular smart glasses we can at least we can get uh, some thermal comfort temperature we can able to reduce the temperatures so with respect to that experimental data, we can able to convince them. Uh, so these particular classes are effective one. So uh, that is what we can able to do. Nagesh Babu, 
could you please have make your comments uh, uh, yes uh, thank you uh, i hope i am audible yes we can hear you uh, so as uh, dr kishore has just pointed out right uh, uh, we need uh, like uh, one platform where we can come up with a generalized uh, testing uh, generalized testing methodologies like for example we have uh, measured sagc of uh, various glasses as well as uh, include like double glazed also so another important parameter as you are uh, saying is another uh, is u value of the windows uh, so uh, generally if we look at though glass provides a very good uh, uh, u value but uh, glass requires some sort of uh, uh, frame and uh, that frame uh, again uh, uh, increases the u value and overall if we look at uh, the window itself uh, you may not be getting the required u value so uh, because of uh, frames are made of aluminium or some metallic frame and uh, if you are making them with wood which is still a good insulation material the problem is it, it is it is not long lasting so we need to come up with some sort of solutions such that the frame also should be integrated within the glass like i have seen some uh, when i visited the asahi industry in roorkee itself so we have visited where they are putting this uh, frame also within as a part of the glass so that would be a good solution but still we need to measure the overall window component what is the total u value so to, because ultimately the u value is the one which decides what will be the total amount of heat that is coming inside the building so this will be one restricting factor when we want to implement these uh, technologies into uh, technology into uh, because for example if we are looking at ecbc constraints so for ecbc requires that entire walling component should be of 0.2 so though glasses are uh, though glasses can come up to u value of 0.2 but frames cannot come up to a u value of 0.2 so we may not be meeting the ecbc guidelines so for ecbc guidelines so uh, some sort of innovation should be happening uh, with respect to the frame of the window also that is one point for uh, rapid adoption of uh, these uh, new technologies and as far as the uh, 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 secondly regarding uh, uh, ec windows are concerned uh, I, it is very interesting to know that uh, sagc is uh, uh, as uh, dr uh, ratish ji was uh, pointing that sagc was 9% uh, i would like to know from ratish ji what is the uh, vlt during the 9% uh, so uh, uh, basically uh, there are four different tint states Okay. uh at the tin state where sgc goes to 9% the vlt is actually 1 okay so that is the least possible means like it's almost opaque you can say it's it's almost dark okay yes. okay so means like uh, generally we don't prefer uh, uh, vlt of 1 but uh, around uh, at a uh, various uh, tin states you might be having an sgc of 20 30 40% percent, how, whatever it might be so uh it again so it depends upon uh, uh, if it is uh, say how much sgc we can reduce that is also going to play a very important role in um, uh, in deciding what is the overall uh, heat that are you you are going to allow inside the building at um, certainly in winter for example in composite climatic conditions like rocky delhi we need more heat to come inside but at the same time in summer we don't want the heat at the same time we need visual Uh, so it is going to be a very challenging uh, so uh, these are things should be uh, mentioned uh, and also these things should be taken care of during our research stage itself so these things should be comprehensively addressed when uh, we want to get them inside uh, implemented in building apart from that i want to uh, mention also uh, like for example these days of uh, philips uh, certain companies like philips chroma they have come up with a mood lighting they are coming coming up with a sort of led bulbs which are uh, they are claiming that they are significantly enhancing their uh, psychological mood uh, similarly you have also mentioned that with the implementation of smart glass you are saying that you have reduced eye strain by 51% fewer headaches by 63% these uh, factors are have to be uh, these factors have to be coming up in the guide uh, guidelines 
for example Correct. ba has come up comes up with a standard guidelines for a glass design in fact uh, our head of the division was uh, uh, dr ashok kumar has uh, uh, come up with the glass co- glass gu- guidelines and glass codes for uh, buildings uh, uh, in bis uh, so here i want to mention like there are certain uh, parameters like uh, what is the color rendering index what are the color temperatures you are going to obtain because uh, uh, the it, it again depends upon the application for example in uh, uh, offices you you may require uh, uh, little uh, cool or warm conditions whereas in uh, houses okay blue color uh, blue tint is okay so these factors also i think definitely play a major role for adoption of glasses inside the buildings because psychological studies there is a whole psychometric uh, psycho psycho analysis of uh, due to mood lighting and uh, lighting that is a completely different subject uh, though i am not an expert of the subject but there are so many uh, factors uh, psychological factors which are dependent upon the interior ambient lighting which actually ultimately decides okay uh, the adoption of these uh, technologies inside uh, official as well as residential buildings and these has to be comprehensively addressed uh, one more if i can categorize the buildings into office office or commercial buildings as well as residential buildings commercial buildings were uh, uh, they have adopted the technologies uh, many it parks in bangalore chennai in fact uh, pune uh, hyderabad uh, there are uh, they are rapidly adopting these technologies as well but coming to residential buildings uh, we have faced a lot of uh, difficulty in uh, adopting though uh, though it is uh, told that the cost of these glasses is uh, more actually this is uh, i don't think from our experience that this is one of the reasons for uh, uh, for the low penetration of this technology into residential sector but uh, rather the other factors like uh, as you were saying that uh you can reduce uh, the uh, uh, eye strain headaches and these have to be uh, these have to be more publicized so that these uh, type of technologies can come inside can come and penetrate well into residential sectors also thank you i would like to add dr nagesh babu uh, on regarding on uh, u value constraint based upon the frame framing technology as uh, i seen uh, some of the presentation which i have uh, heard earlier regarding the framing technology people are utilizing nowadays uh, bamboo bamboos also to control the u value emissions so uh, i guess uh, csir or uh, some other kind of labs can focus such kind of developmental uh, technologies of electrochromic glasses while uh, laminating use uh, such kind of bamboo sticks for making such kind of uh, reduction of u value also uh yes definitely there is a uh, complete uh, mission mode project happening in our uh, uh cbri we have come up with a complete building framing materials everything with bamboo so uh it is possible it is uh, possible we have to come up with uh, some collaboration and think about uh, such solutions where because bamboo has uh, comparatively bamboo is a very good uh, lasting material so when we think about uh, integrating uh, whatever be the technology in buildings we need to think about uh, at least 22 as previously also being pointed out 20 to 50 years of uh, lifetime uh, for example large commercial buildings they uh, they will be thinking at least of uh, 30 to 50 years life and uh, residential buildings also 20 to 30 years of life so we need to think uh, at that level and then come up with these technologies yes is modification of bamboo wood wood to with uh, some other chemical uh, reaction we makes uh, some kind of strengthable uh, material also such yes, as i think i think dr kishore should uh, comment on um, uh, chemical modified bamboo yes as uh, we know that bamboo uh, as a material without treatment uh, the life of bamboo is maybe 3 to 4 years so we need to with respect to boric acid we need to treat that bamboo so that we can able to utilize for a longer few, period few, few universities were uh, were doing some kind of research in sweden uh, i didn't remember the correct university names so some of the universities in the sweden and uh, some of the companies they are working on this kind of technologies 
Yes, and uh, regarding this particular frame, as uh, uh, Dr. Nagesh has pointed out, ULU we cannot able to maintain. The another problem with this that thermal bridging effect will take care because of this particular framing. Uh, in particular frame for that purpose, uh, aluminum is uh, basically it is used. And if you take the cross sectional area, so almost uh, the 10% uh, area, 10 to 20% area uh, is coming to the frame. So in that case, even though we are restricting the heat gain from through this particular insulated windows, but the other areas like uh, these particular frames, wherein uh, through that we can uh, we cannot avoid that one. So for that, uh, the other countries what they are using is uh, the insulating material uh, for this to cover this uh, thermal bridging. So that insulating material we can use uh, along with the aluminum frame so that we can avoid that uh, entry of heat. My, my next question is to uh, Dr. Narayan Nuni, who is the coordinator of uh, different verticals of energy activities at CSIR. How do you rate the smart glass technologies developed by different CSIR laboratories from an industry point of view? Because one of our panelists just mentioned that industries are not aware of any industry scale technologies from India. What do we actually lack in projecting our developments so as to get into focus discussions with industries? Yeah, very good question. In fact, uh, it is not only uh, the industrial representatives, but uh, sometimes we also feel that uh, the activities happening in CSIR labs are not really publicized very well, so that uh, the stakeholders are uh, becoming aware of that. But, um, then, uh, one thing after listening to all the discussions, what I feel is that Two mics are on. I am hearing an echo. Okay. So, yeah. After after listening to all the discussions, what I am feeling is that we are at global level in materials design and uh, proving at a concept level, a proof of concept level in lab. But uh, for large area manufacturing or scale up of materials, we are not there. So. Even if you think about pilot production, I think there should be a stage in between uh, what uh, I would like to call a pre-pilot level. Even that is not established in many of our labs, which are actually focusing on electrochromic or even large area fabrication facilities. So in many places, even in our place, 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter is the largest. That is for another application for photovoltaic. But to instill confidence and to come up to a level where we can have a discussion with the industry, I think it needs to go a little bit more in terms of uh, TRL and also on processing capabilities. Material side, I have no doubt that uh, uh, we are there because that is proven with academic uh, literature, published works and uh, all those activities. But I think uh, what industry probably requires is, uh, is an assurance that this can be taken up both in process and in scale up, scale up of materials in a larger uh, platform. So projects should be uh, identified in uh, identified with this in mind. And then uh, we need to have these industries. We normally say this right from the beginning, but it never happens. When we have something, we go and try to advertise, see, we have done this, are you interested? That is not the way of doing this. That's what I was thinking. We should plan projects right from the beginning with the industry as a partner. In certain cases, we have done that but uh, there is a lot of uh, scope for improvement in that sector. And uh, listening to the discussions, I was thinking that uh, somebody mentioned about the uh, control of uh, the incoming light so that it will not interfere with the psychological aspects of people. Uh, I, I assume that uh, he mentioned uh, tampering the circadian rhythm of people because you know people who work late in the night, they want to cut off this uh, blue light and things like that. So along with that, I would suggest that uh, we had a discussion between me and Vishu also, that these windows could be multifunctional windows. Some of these windows can even be a source of light in itself because our related technologies are there. So having uh, that kind of incorporating multifunctionality into these windows may be a very good uh, idea to start with. And uh, having said all these things and listened to all the discussions, what I feel is that the recommendation of this workshop should be such that the pre-pilot line or by whatever name you call it 
the pre uh, scale up strategies how we develop so that kind of a recommendation should be submitted to maybe principal scientific advisors office uh, to have some uh, brainstorming session or to have a wider consortium and then to submit projects of national importance i think uh, people like dr ashish lele can uh, take it up and uh, talk to psa's office or even csa matter to get a, a larger platform so that we all of us can come together and uh, develop uh, uh, so certain products where we all have interest you know i'm not i understand there may be a lot of uh, uh, conflicts of interest when industrial partners are there but still there may be a way to develop certain technologies by uh, leveraging on the expertise that we have in individual labs and individual uh, institutions that is for you know, that is for sure so that is what i wanted to say thank you srijit dr dev yeah, I just want to make a comment uh, because see, uh, when we have a large scale device and then uh, we went for this technology development, uh, we can ask for you, we ask for a system that can go up to one kit by one kit. Uh, it is really because that time we uh, discussed, me, Srijit, Dr. Unni was probably there also. Dr. Joshi, uh, we all discussed that uh, one fit by one, one fit, such kind of instrument is a correct size for our lab. We are not a process plant and we cannot go, you know, there is no end of it. Uh, Sometimes uh, people can ask one meter by one meter, but we are a research institute. It is not our uh, really requirement uh, to demonstrate in that kind of level. So I think after a while, Indian, Indian uh, industries should come up and uh, that handholding should happen at somewhere because government cannot fund and i also think that is justified that i cannot go and ask for funding uh, to make it one 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 meter by one meter because there is no such you know boundary or uh, 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 you know uh, uh, limit that uh, how far we can go or how far uh, industries can ask and uh, the government uh, funding, we have to be, you know, responsible and uh, we have to be answerable also that how much money we are utilizing and uh, in the end of the day, what we are delivering to the people. Because if we make this such a huge facility and nothing comes up, then also it is uh, doesn't look good for both government and for us. So I think uh, Ratish has some comment on this. And uh, specifically, uh, I since I am just speaking, we need to end the session also. Uh, I want to uh, ask a question to Ratish and uh, Praveen also that, uh, have you thought about uh, uh, something in the medical sector, like in the operation theater and all, where people use curtains? And these uh, curtains are actually a magnet for a lot of infection and all that. So, some electrochromic or some glazing system that can go uh, for this kind of privacy application. I know that SPD kind of techniques are there, but I don't know how cost efficient they are. So maybe a comment from either of you. Thank you. Ratish, you are muted. Right? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Dave, and uh, thank you, Dr. Unni, for highlighting a, a major. Uh, gap area today and uh, uh, wh what uh, Dr. Dev said is also right like see as in research institute there is only so much a research institute can do uh, and uh, when it comes to an industry there are also constraints with respect to an industry so the middle part is basically where we also see as a huge gap area and uh, uh, India has very strong material scientists we can uh, figure out all the aspects on the material but how do you really make it into a process and how do you uh, basically do an application of it that's where a lot of research is also required uh, it is not necessarily fabricating a prototype of uh, say one meter by three meter or so that's uh, the word that you used is the uh, exact word uh, dr Uni, like pre-piloting uh, if you really look at uh, basically trl levels uh, uh, most times what we also see as a gap is uh, when the material problem is solved we think it's ready uh, at a trl9 or so to be deployed we have uh, even a one feet by one feet prototype which is doing excellent in terms of durability results and other things but uh, uh, if uh, from an industry perspective 
those should be at a TRL level of four or lower. Uh, and where the industry can really take charge fully is when it is at a TRL of seven or higher. So the gap uh, area is basically where there is a lot of uh, joint work to be done. And as uh, Professor Lele also mentioned, like that is essentially an area where a lot of startups and entrepreneurs will also start playing in. Uh, because as an industry, there are also constraints, uh, just like how uh, uh, Dr. Dev was mentioning, like, okay, we are putting in so much, what is really the effort that is coming in? So uh, that gray area is basically where all of us have to really work together uh, to kind of uh, bring it in. So it has to be something like a consortium um, uh, where we can work on how do we really bring a pilot of it. So that's the uh, first part. And uh, Dr. Dev, uh, on to your uh, question on hospitals and other areas. Uh, it is not necessary to have an electrochromic type of active glazing all the time. Uh, it could also be something like a, a polymer diffused liquid crystals, which as a product exists uh, in India. Uh, there are a lot of local processes who are doing it as well. And uh, so those kind of products are quite suited for hospitals, even office interiors, and sometimes even for exteriors, which is more of an instantaneous. And that is also uh, kind of what is desired uh, uh, in a lot of these places. Even if you take automotive, for example, uh, see any of these electrochromic devices has their own switching time. The fastest switching. Oh, uh, you are, uh, you have answered because I, I did not stick to electrochromic in that sense. Uh, because SPD kind of like uh, the device you are uh, selling, uh, it is pretty common now and also, exactly. you know, and pretty cheap. So exactly. I wanted to know that how much energy efficient it would be. It would be more energy efficient because some energy penalty is there. So that is why I asked that question. Correct. So, so it is not energy efficient. I think uh, some of these SPD system are opaque uh, and you have to apply electricity to make it transparent. So there are two things, Dr. Dave. Uh, one is an SPD, which is more of, uh, 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 it can basically block uh, the solar spectrum. Right. And that is PDLC. Uh, so uh, uh, SPD is suspended particles and PDLC is polymer diffused uh, liquid crystals. So a polymer diffused liquid crystal doesn't really have any uh, solar blocking capability. What it does is it basically just brings in haze level uh, so that uh, it gives privacy. So it is not a system that uh, would be recommended for like a solar blocking application. It has to be coupled with some sort of a coating to get that kind of a feature. Uh, as you rightly said, like in hospitals, there is also one more area uh, where active materials are also looked upon. Uh, uh, if you have uh, basically a MRI or a CT scan area where you have to block a lot of X-ray uh, and uh, so, I mean, you have to basically block radiations which are beyond just the solar spectrum itself. Uh, so there are a few active products in uh, those kind of spectrums as well. So uh, bottom line is like uh, based on the application, there is a possibility to tune different products uh, for different applications. And also there needs to be some sort of an uh, uh, industry and research handholding to fill the gap area where how do you really bring a prototype? Uh, a one feet by one feet is a good demonstration, but only when it becomes a larger size, you will understand the process issues because processing them is a huge problem today. And also the durability issues when it is scaling. Um, um, so even if the, all the process issues and all those things are sorted out, how do you basically get a uniform coating? That is basically a key challenge. And that's where also a lot of application related research is also something uh, that institutes like CSI uh, AR can really take up. Uh, uh, how do you really solve some of these process bottlenecks? That's when the industry also will come in with their well, understanding of the process. Well, well said, Dr. Ritesh. Ritesh has said, well said. This is the one of the biggest challenge we had, the every industry was focusing. Processing issue as well as the durability. Durability of the product, uh, one feet by one feet, it may give the results in uh, lab scale in a very higher level. But once it is coming to the customer point of view, one feet by one feet, when I am taking from one place to one place, the entire results of uh, variation is drastically changing. How and in, in what way it can overcome? So, uh, 
we have a, a technical question that came from the audience also uh, maybe dr dev or uh, mr ritesh can answer these questions how do you ensure homogeneity of pixels to get uniform coloration over the total facade area and is it possible to specifically filter or block the uv or visible light as required by the user yeah, that's again uh, basically uh, linking back to what me and uh, dr vemuri are trying to highlight uh, that's that is basically the biggest challenge area uh, today uh, in in fact uh, these coatings are actually nano scale so and it is done using sputtering uh, uh, so you would ideally uh, low i mean tweak with your line speed and other things to get the uniformity uh, and that's where basically challenge also comes in terms of the materials yes uh, so if you are using electrochromic materials uh, uh, the kind of spray nozzles itself and other things uh, has to be worked on and that's a very important area as a research that we have to really take up forward uh, what I believe uh, that homogeneity of the pixel is, of course, uh, a big, uh, you know, challenge, and that we already identified. And it is, uh, I think, it is something like uh, display industry, because all the pixels in a display may not work in the same fashion, and they they have underlying electronics that optimizes. Okay, it may uh, it may lead to some cost enhancement. But uh, in electrochromic sector also, I don't know to what extent because we are studying it, but I don't know to what extent it is possibly can be solved by material scientists. It is more like an engineering problem. So we yeah. have to have a, a system that can give, uh, give the optimized output because user won't see, user will just uh, turn on the switch. But there, there has to be an electronics developed uh, before uh, the power goes to windows or different pixels so that it, we can get an optimized output. Yeah. I think, uh, Dr. Praveen also asked uh, the same question. Yeah, uh, and Dr. Deb, you are exactly right. Like, see, uh, uh, because when it comes to electrochromic, it's no more just a coating, it's no more just a glass. It is an device, uh, just like your electronic TV units or so. And just like how every TV unit is tested for a few hundred cycles, uh, every electrochromic device, actually, when it is coming at an industrial scale, so we do a cycling Like right? for every sage glass or every private, uh, which is the PDLC glass that is uh, shipped out, uh, it is actually tested out for a few cycles. Various measurements are taken, including what is the overall conductivity, and uh, we take different segments and analyze, and it becomes more of an engineering problem to solve. and. Uh, uh, even then, we find like uh, maintaining a yield is a difficulty. Mm. Right. And coming to the second question, it is is it possible to prepare specialty filters to block the UV or visible light? Okay. Uh, so we are talking about glass, and uh, you know many glass have uh, coatings to uh, block the UV anyway. And uh, some material we are using with that have a band gap around that range. So you UV is usually blocked. But uh, if any particular case uh, you want to block UV, and uh, that is, I don't think it's a huge challenge because UV is a larger, you know, energy. So higher uh, energy. So anyway, uh, that can be blocked uh, with a filter. And uh, visible light, of course, yeah, it is possible to block. We can make visible light filters with many kind of glazing technologies like we are discussing, the electrochromic glazing and other glazing. We can specifically uh, block visible light and make it transparent to other sort of light. But uh, when it uh, comes to glass, you know, glass itself has a wavelength range that it can pass. So, we have we have to uh, uh, you know confine to that limit. So you need to uh, change different glass types to have a specific kind of you know uh, throughput. Uh, yeah. you you are absolutely right, uh, Doctor Dev. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, another challenge is the scale. Uh, so if you want to filter out very specific wavelengths or spectrums, uh, it is possible, uh, and that's how. Majority of our spectrophotometers, uh, lasers, all of them work. 
Uh, but as you really scale this uh, to a larger size, when you're talking about glass, you're talking about something that can go on an entire building facade or even a window for that matter. The scale is basically something that is quite uh, big. Uh, so also the cost is something that goes up really high if you want to specifically block out certain areas. And uh, in fact, I would like to highlight uh, a particular uh, uh, product. Uh, uh, it's called Contrex. Uh, so uh, basically, that is used to actually block specifically X-rays. Uh, and it is coated with the, uh, uh, so the glass basically becomes quite heavy. The density is uh, extremely high. Uh, at times, it is double the uh, normal glass uh, uh, density. And uh, it has basically various, uh, 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 various materials doped in the glass itself. Uh, so that it can absorb uh, and it can block a particular uh, block a particular spectrum of X-rays which comes out of MRIs. Uh, so similarly, it can be done. Uh, theoretically, it is possible, but scaling it and really bringing it out as a large product is basically where the difficulty lies. Okay, so uh, I understand that we have just discussed the tip of the iceberg, but uh, due to lack of time, we may have to wind up the panel discussion. So uh, one last question to all the panel members, uh, maybe if you could just answer in one word would be great. What do you think would be an acceptable cost per meter square of smart glass with a reasonable payback period? Uh, if you can just give a number, one meter square, if you want to install it in your homes as a customer, what would be the acceptable cost per meter square of smart glass? Maybe Mr. Ratish can start just the number. What would you expect to be? A... No, I think the industry folks should go last because we will buy uh, uh So me and Dr. Avery can go last. Uh... Okay, so let's start with Dr. Unni. So are you asking me the price? Yes. If you want to install, if you as a customer, what cost would you prefer to have it installed at your home? I don't want to make an estimate like that. Since experts are there. Not estimate. It, you say that you are uh, installing a window. So we are selling a smart window to you. So how yes. much you can pay? Right. So that expert should actually, because we anyway don't install smart windows. So <laughs> I think we will leave that for the all the participants to think over. And uh, I thank all the panelists for a wonderful panel discussion. And now may I invite Dr. Narayan Unni for his concluding remarks. Uh, excuse me, sir. Can, can I comment? Kishore wants to say something. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. So I think uh, in our ordinary way we consider as our aluminum frame glass windows, wherein 150 rupees per square feet. That means maybe 1,500 rupees that we consider. So. If uh, if uh, the cost is increased by three to four times, then obviously we wanted uh, it should be at maybe not three to four times, but two times means maybe three thousand to four thousand rupees per square meter. Maybe the cost, if that comes, then obviously people can uh, use that windows. So my another one, just uh, as a doubt, I am asking: uh, Is there any condensation problem? Is there with respect to these glasses? That is the one thing. And another thing is that because uh, our Indians, we go for the natural ventilated building. So in case of this particular smart windows, wherein we have to go for the, the uh, our uh, uh, concealed kind of uh, envelope, then can, can we use the natural ventilation in this particular uh, windows that I wanted to answer just by my curiosity. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Kishore. Uh, so, with respect to condensation, uh, see, like, uh, the smart uh, glazing is uh, just a coating that is coming on the inside face of an IGU. Uh, so, like any other IGU, based on the ceiling that is done properly, if the ceiling is done properly, condensation should not be an issue. And it is basically completely dependent on the sealants. It's not uh, anything, a specific problem for uh, smart glazing itself. And uh, there are variety of uh, uh, nice sealants available in the market to ensure basically 
uh, this is not done. And even at a facade level, there are testings that are done to ensure condensation uh, doesn't occur. So answering your second question, uh, uh, there are frames in which you can actually mount the smart glazing as a part of uh, uh, the facade or even as a window so that you can open it and have your natural ventilation also possible. May I now Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Narayan Nuni for his concluding remarks. Thank you, Srijit. I don't think there is nothing much to conclude because uh, we have looked at uh, in such a short time span, whatever from whatever angles we can look at the problem. I think we have uh, done that. And I'm sure that everybody will agree with me that this was really a very uh, interactive brainstorming session, apart from presentations. Uh, all the presentations were really of high quality and they opened up new avenues for discussion, uh, collaboration, and even individual research, I would like to say. And as we discussed before, I think uh, this should be a kind of a beginning for a larger collaboration between industry and uh, CSIR. And uh, like I mentioned, we'll try to see whether how we can build a consortium around the participants here and submit uh, a major proposal. To uh, with industry funding or uh, to the government of India in that sense. I see that after uh, hearing all the comments, I think cost is still a major factor because even people who are having ready-made technologies are not willing to actually market uh, in the current stage because probably the cost projections will be much higher than a normal, normal window or like uh, Dr. Dev was saying, a simple curtain sometimes will be much better. So these are the questions that we need to address with regard to uh, but but I think you know uh, sometimes like we generally say the challenges become opportunities as well because some some speaker mentioned that uh, the the design of the smart window should actually reflect on the kind of uh, geographical location also because mm -hmm. the uh, uh, sun solar flux will be different temperature will be different and like that then I would say that India is actually the best. Uh, uh, country to study this because we have such a wide range of uh, climate across and uh, people like uh, them and all should focus on this aspect and see what we can do with the support of uh, people like uh, Dr. Memory and uh, Rajesh and all other people. So uh, the, I think uh, we have come to the end of the session. Let me request uh, Dr. Srijit to uh, propose a formal word of thanks. Shijit, you are muted. Thank you, Dr. Oni. We have just concluded an inter intensive session on the development of smart glass technologies and the significance and scope for such technologies in regulating and managing indoor energy consumption in the country. I would like to thank each and every person involved in the organization of this event. The iConnect events are organized as part of Asadika Amrit Mahalsav celebrations, marking 75 years of India's independence. The entire government mechanism has supported us in the successful conduct of the conclave, and I would like to place on record our sincere gratitude to the Ministry of Science and Technology, the Ministry of Health Sciences, and all the associated departments. Special thanks are due to the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research and the entire CSIR family, including our headquarters and all laboratories for the constant support and guidance in organizing this event. On behalf of all the event coordinators, I would like to thank Dr. Ashish Lele, Director CSIR NIST and CSIR NCL for his inaugural remarks, for his participation in the conclave and all his guidance during the entire organizational process. Let me take this opportunity to thank all our industry speakers, Dr. Praveen Kumar Vemuri from Asahi, Mr. Ratish from Saint Gobain and Mr. Masim, Dr. Masimba from Glass Futures. The event would not have been successful without your participation and on behalf of all the organizers and all the participants, we thank you from the bottom of our heart. We would like to thank Dr. Masimba Philip particularly for taking his time during off hours at the UK and presenting at the conclave. I would like to thank all the esteemed panelists, Dr. Nagesh Babu, Dr. Kishore Kulkarni, Dr. Sujada Devi, who accepted our invitation and participated actively in the panel discussion. I would also like to place on record our sincere gratitude to Dr. Vibha Malhotra, Head Technology Management Directorate, CSIR, Devendra Singh, Principal Scientist, and the whole team for the organizational support and coordination. We also thank the team from NFDC and all agencies involved in hosting this online event. The organization of an event of this magnitude cannot happen overnight. The wheels started rolling a few months ago, 
and I would like to mention three names at this juncture who had been instrumental in coordinating and organizing this event. Our former director, Dr. A. Ajay Ghosh, and my colleagues, Dr. K. Narayan Nunni and Dr. Vishwapriya Dev. I thank each of them for their rel relentless efforts in making this event a grand success. I also thank all my colleagues at CSIR NIST who has contributed immensely to this iConnect event. Last but not the least, I thank all the participants for attending and we hope that this event will open doors for future collaborations and faster commercialization of smart glass technologies. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank, you. Thank you all. Thank you. Very good program. Quite useful. Thank you all. Yes, sir, you are mute. And we need to we need to submit a report of the event to the principal scientific advisors office after mm -hmm. the so we will prepare it and circulate also to all of you to get the inputs and then we submit it okay okay thank you so thank you thank you very much.